Hello, dear misfits. Today you'll meet fear. We're going to talk for a few hours about bone-chilling true stories of encounters with the creatures, paranormal, and the cryptic cryptids that dwell in the corners of our world. Will you dare to delve into these dark mysteries with us? If so, don't forget to hit subscribe and join us. And as always, thank you. And now... Story time! I've always been a pragmatic man. I didn't believe in tales spun around campfires, or the whispers of shadows that live in the corners of one's eyes. I was a straightforward guy, a military man who enjoyed a good beer and didn't bother much with the supernatural. I was from Spain, but had moved to the States as a kid. I went to high school here, joined the military, and ended up stationed near the border. My Spanish came in handy, and I would often cross the border into Mexico. It was in Mexico that I met her, the woman who would become my wife. Back then, she was just my girlfriend, a beautiful enigma who I was just beginning to unravel. Her father was an enigmatic man himself, a drafting teacher at a local college and a firm believer in the paranormal. I thought he was crazy, with his talks about UFOs and death. But he asked me one day if I believed in death. I told him we were all going to die. He clarified, no, the actual Grim Reaper. Do you believe in it? I laughed it off, thinking he was just trying to rattle me. But he was serious. My girlfriend, now my wife, was quiet as her father asked me what I would think if he showed me a picture of death itself, the Grim Reaper. I didn't know what to make of it. My girlfriend just smiled at me, her mother chimed in from the kitchen, and I was sitting there, in a foreign country, with people I barely knew, thinking I was caught in some bizarre horror film. He offered to show me the picture, and despite my growing apprehension, I agreed. He returned with pictures, postcard sized and flipped over. He began to explain how these pictures came into his possession. A friend of his, who owned a camera shop, had called him urgently one day. A man had brought in a picture of his brother on his deathbed, taken in the 40s or 50s. He wanted the picture restored, and when the picture was blown up during the restoration process, the Grim Reaper was visible at the foot of the bed. My heart pounded in my chest as he finally flipped the pictures over. What I saw was just as he described. The man lying on the bed, the flowers by his side, and there at the foot of his bed was the figure. A dark robe with no connection to the ground, skeletal fingers clutching a stick, a skull peeking out from beneath a hood, and the stick topped with a sickle. I felt a chill run down my spine, my blood turned to ice, and I had to look away. I couldn't sleep for days after that. I was stationed in a barracks on a base, and every time I closed my eyes, I saw the picture. My friends noticed my unrest, and when I told them the story, they didn't believe me. I even invited some of them over to Mexico to see the picture, and they were as shaken as I was. To this day, I can't forget that picture, and I haven't seen it since. The Grim Reaper was real to me in that moment, as real as the picture that I held in my hands. I had been a skeptic, but that experience shook me to my core. It was a window into a world that I had chosen to ignore, a world that was as real as the one I lived in. It was a chilling reminder of our mortality, and it was a memory that would haunt me for the rest of my life. My friends and I decided to meet up for a casual chat in the park one afternoon. We were strolling through the woods, enjoying the fresh air and the sounds of nature when we came across some abandoned toilets. At first, we didn't think much of it. It was just another sign of urban decay, a forgotten structure lost in the midst of the woods. However, as we walked around to the back of the toilets, we saw something that made our hearts stop. Through the blurry glass, we could see what looked like a figure, an arm, and a hand dangling in the air. It appeared as if someone had hanged themselves, or worse, been hanged. It was a terrifying sight, one that instantly filled us with fear. We stood frozen in shock for a moment before deciding we needed a second opinion. We didn't want to jump to conclusions, 
but we couldn't ignore what we were seeing either. Spotting a passerby, we quickly called him over and asked him to take a look. We wanted to confirm if we were just hallucinating or if there was genuinely something there. To our growing horror, he saw the same thing. His daughter, who had been trailing behind him, also saw the same chilling sight. At their suggestion, we decided to report the matter to the police. The seriousness of the situation was sinking in, and we knew we needed to act responsibly. We quickly made our way to the local police station, where we gave them our details and explained the situation. They assured us they would send an officer to the location as soon as possible. As we left the police station, we couldn't shake off the eerie feeling. We had gone out for a simple meet-up, a walk in the park, and ended up stumbling upon something so chilling. The image was burnt into our minds, and the fear was still palpable. I promise to keep everyone updated as soon as we hear back from the police. We can only hope now that it's not what we fear it is. It was a typically quiet morning when I got a call from Jeannie, a resident who lived about 30 miles up DL Boulevard. I've known Jeannie for years. We grew up together in the same small town, and she's always been the type to keep to herself. So when I heard her voice trembling over the phone, I knew something was wrong. Something's been here, in my driveway, she stammered, her voice shaky. A huge footprint. In the mud. My brows furrowed in confusion. A footprint, Jeannie? I echoed, trying to comprehend what she was saying. Yes, it's. It's massive. I ain't seen anything like it before. I assured her I would be there soon and quickly set off in my truck, driving the familiar route up DL Boulevard. As I turned up Boundary Road, my mind raced with possibilities. Could it be a bear? But Jeannie's house was a fair distance from the forest's edge. Perhaps some pranksters trying to give her a scare? Pulling up the driveway, I saw Jeannie standing there, her face pale and her eyes wide with fear. She led me to the footprint, and my heart skipped a beat. There, embedded in the mud, was an enormous footprint. It was much larger than any human foot, and it had a peculiar shape that was distinctly non-human. The toes were long and had sharp, claw-like protrusions at the tips. The heel was broader than any creature's foot I had seen. I knelt down beside it, my mind racing. I had been working as a park ranger for over 10 years, and I had seen all sorts of animal tracks. But this, this was different. This was something I had never seen before. As I traced my fingers over the imprint, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Whatever had left this footprint was huge, and potentially dangerous. It was my duty to find out what it was and ensure the safety of the residents. In the following days, I led a team of experts to examine the footprint. We cast a plaster mold of it, hoping to identify the creature that had wandered so close to human habitation. We searched the nearby woods, looking for any signs of this unknown creature, but all we found were more questions. The footprint became a local mystery. Some said it was a hoax, others believed it was a creature from local legends. But for me, it was a reminder of the unknown that still exists in our world, a mystery that I am yet to solve. Every day, as I patrol the woods, I keep my eyes open, wondering if I'll come across another such footprint, hoping that one day I'll come face to face with the creature that left it behind. This story was told to me by my uncle, who happens to be a park ranger in Ontario. He frequently comments on how calm his work has been after pandemic, with fewer tourists visiting. However, there are still instances where he has to venture into the wilderness to check on things. One day, he had to navigate through the woods with a colleague due to reports of unauthorized individuals in the area. These reports were not uncommon usually involving mean-spirited teenagers causing trouble. However, what made these reports peculiar was the description of people carrying unusual items like axes and animal skulls. It was just weird stuff, and my uncle knew that people could be pretty racist in those parts. 
speculations arose that these individuals could be Algonquin people, as the park was situated on their land. The thought of unhinged people worshipping Odin in the cold wilderness of modern-day Canada seemed far-fetched, but my uncle couldn't ignore the strange occurrences. As they ventured deeper into the wilderness, they discovered odd symbols carved into tree trunks, remnants of trash, and markings on the ground. It appeared that people had been actively camping in restricted areas. However, despite their efforts, my uncle and his colleague never encountered any campers during their patrols. But there were always weird things left behind, like a cape, a helmet, and even a real sword, as if someone had been indulging in Nordic cult practices. There were also traces of incense and other religious paraphernalia. These findings only added to the mystery surrounding the area. One night, my uncle and his colleague decided to set up camp near a massive elm tree for shelter against the frigid winds that plagued the nights. They enjoyed a meal of heated beans and rice while exchanging stories. They maintained communication with a portable radio to stay connected with the base. At one point, my uncle excused himself to relieve himself in the woods while his colleague remained by the fire. As minutes passed, my uncle realized that his colleague hadn't returned. Concerned, he called out for him, but there was no response. The atmosphere in the woods had become eerily quiet, devoid of the usual sounds of the night. A faint whisper caught my uncle's attention from his right side. He strained to listen and moved in that direction, guided by the weak voice. It sounded like his colleague, but something felt off. The woods seemed too calm and quiet, giving my uncle an unsettling feeling. He called out to the voice, growing stronger as he ventured deeper into the wilderness. Then, he heard his colleague's voice, calling for help. However, my uncle sensed that something wasn't right. The tone and modulation of the voice didn't match his colleague's usual manner of speaking. It was an instinctual feeling that urged my uncle to proceed with caution. Armed with his rifle and flashlight, my uncle scanned the area, searching for any sign of his colleague. Instead, he came face to face with an unimaginable sight. Standing about four or five meters away, in a small clearing surrounded by tall trees, was a tall, genderless figure. Its thin frame and moose skull-like head with antlers made it clear that this being was not of this world. The creature moved closer, emitting distorted and crackly sounds that mimicked his colleague's voice. Fearing for his safety, my uncle fired a warning shot into the air before turning and running as fast as he could. The unearthly noise that followed him was unlike anything human. My uncle ran until he realized he was lost in the dark wilderness. He had to wait for daylight to find his way back to the trail, relying only on his dying flashlight. When he finally reunited with his colleague, John, it became apparent that John had experienced a similarly unsettling night. When my uncle returned to the campsite, nobody was there. John had heard my uncle's calls during the night and had also encountered strange noises that he couldn't quite comprehend. Concerned for my uncle's well-being, he waited anxiously for his return. In the morning, my uncle emerged from the wilderness, exhausted and disoriented. He recounted the events of the previous night to John, who listened intently, his worry growing with each passing word. They both believed that what they had encountered was something supernatural, possibly a windigo. Although my uncle was not particularly religious or inclined to believe in such things, he understood the importance of respecting the rules of the wild. In the depths of the wilderness, where the line between reality and the unknown blurs, he realized that there are forces beyond our comprehension. From that day forward, my uncle and John never spoke of their encounter to anyone else. They carried the weight of that experience, knowing that some things are better left unexplained. The incident served as a reminder of the mysteries that dwell in the depths of the wilderness, hidden from the prying eyes of ordinary life. Even now, as time has passed, my uncle remains haunted by that encounter. The memory lingers, a constant reminder that there are realms and creatures beyond our understanding. It has changed him, instilling in him a deeper respect for the unknown and a sense of awe for the vastness of the natural world. Though their story may seem unbelievable to some, 
Those who have ventured deep into the wilderness understand that there are things out there that defy explanation. My uncle and John carry their experience as a testament to the mysterious and uncharted aspects of our existence, forever changed by their encounter with the supernatural. I'm going to remain anonymous for this. But, I had a signing of something that I can't explain in 2011 springtime. During the time, I was working as a police officer for a small town in northwestern Oklahoma. What made me take an interest in this particular case was the description given to me by the witness. It sounded just like how other witnesses have described other abnormals to include Sasquatch. I had one individual coming to the department as they were reporting what they thought they saw. It appeared to be a man with long black hair, no shirt or clothes, standing near their pond at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Apparently, it looks like they were holding a knife or some sort of weapon. As he noticed them looking out their window, he began walking into the wood line, disappearing from view. Nonetheless, never returning only after several attempts of trying to find him by the reporting party. I'm not sure what he had actually had in his hand. I never asked him a description of it specifically. But, I began to do some research on my own. I came across several websites dedicated to Bigfoot sightings where individuals could almost describe perfectly with many others what they had seen. In my years as an officer before retiring from law enforcement, I've come across multiple reports of unusual creatures being seen all throughout Oklahoma as well as neighboring states. In fact, just last year alone, I had another retired law enforcement officer tell me all about an experience that their own individual mother-in-law had while she lived out on a farm near Elk City. She told him about a time she had gone out to her chicken coop and had a face-to-face -face encounter with a small monkey-type animal standing on two feet without hair. It looked like it was wearing pants. It began making loud sounds before running away. It appeared as if it had jumped over multiple fences only to disappear into the tree line. I also know that many people have reported seeing humanoid creatures looking similar to how Bigfoot looked and how Bigfoot is described. All through various areas all around Elk City, Shawnee as well, and even the town I grew up in, Guthrie where witnesses and victims claim these creatures prey on livestock, chickens, goats, pigs, everything. This is also not the only time I've received reports involving unusual creatures that match what has been described by the witness to include Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I'm sure these things happen all the time throughout the US and even other countries throughout the world. However, I'm most familiar with Oklahoma and it appears to be designated for many areas of things like this. I really doubt a lot of these stories are made up. If you got a chance to sit down and talk to these witnesses, they're terrified. Something is happening here. What could these creatures be? How does somebody prove their existence without anyone ever actually catching one? Do they really exist in different forms? The Smoky Mountains National Park felt like a universe away from the concrete jungle of New York City that I'd always called home. The air was cleaner, the quiet more profound, and the sheer expanse of wilderness was mind-boggling. Ancient trees, like sentinels, stood tall, their leaves whispering secrets of centuries in the wind. The forest floor was a symphony of life, crackling underfoot with every step I took. My name is Rebecca Miles, though everyone calls me Becky. I was assigned to this park as a part of my community service sentence for a minor infraction. My task was simple, to monitor the illegal logging activities that had recently spiked in the area. But the reality of it was far more complex, and soon I found myself entangled in a web of events that felt straight out of a science fiction novel. It started with strange sightings, Rumors whispered among the locals about a creature that resembled the mythical Sasquatch. I brushed it off as local folklore until one evening when I crossed paths with the unimaginable. There it stood, a hulking figure, covered in thick fur, with eyes that held an uncanny intelligence. The encounter was brief and terrifying. It disappeared into the forest, leaving me with a racing heart and a newfound realization, 
The Sasquatch was real. The situation escalated when the creature, or creatures, as it seemed there was more than one, started to show signs of aggressive behavior. Reports poured in about sightings near local communities, of livestock missing, and of an inexplicable fear among the residents. It dawned on me that the Sasquatch, like the other animals in the park, were losing their habitats due to the illegal logging. I was faced with a challenge unlike any other. Not only did I have to expose the illegal loggers, but I also had to pacify the Sasquatch and find a way to restore their habitats. The days turned into a blur of tracking the loggers, collecting evidence, and studying the patterns of the Sasquatch. The task was perilous, and many a time, I found myself narrowly escaping danger. Finally, armed with enough evidence, I reached out to the police. They were skeptical at first, but the undeniable proof made them swing into action. The illegal logging operation was busted, and a plan was put in place to restore the damaged parts of the forest. The Sasquatch, however, was a more complex problem. With the help of local experts, we managed to locate and confront the aggressive Sasquatch. The encounter was terrifying and intense. It ended with the Sasquatch's death, a resolution I was not entirely comfortable with, but was deemed necessary for the safety of the local communities. The police, while grateful for my help, made it clear that the existence of the Sasquatch was to remain a secret. They threatened me with serious consequences if word got out about our discovery. As I returned to my small cabin in the heart of the forest that night, I couldn't help but feel a sense of loss. I had entered this park a city girl with a punishment to serve, but I was leaving with a profound respect for the wilderness and its secrets. Here's what happened. I was at work one day when my co-worker started talking about a strange creature he had seen. Curiosity peaked, I asked him to describe the creature in detail. As he told me about it, I couldn't help but think it sounded familiar. I pulled up a picture of the Mothman on my phone and showed it to him, asking if the creature he saw looked anything like that. To my surprise, he said it did. Intrigued, I asked him to contact his friends who had been with him during the sighting and show them the picture as well. They all separately confirmed that what they saw looked exactly like the Mothman. My co-worker then recounted the entire story, two years ago, in the city of Wilmington, California, near a massive ARCO refinery, my co-worker and three of his friends were hanging out in his backyard at around 2 AM. One of them happened to look up and spotted a winged creature flying above them. He said it didn't do anything out of the ordinary, but it circled their group about five times before heading north toward the city of Torrance, where the Los Angeles International Airport is located. He added that they saw the creature again later that night, at around 4.35 am. This time, it repeated its circling behavior but only went around them two or three times before flying off towards the city of Long Beach. They never saw the creature again after that. My co-worker then mentioned that he thought he might have seen the Mothman again a week later, but he wasn't entirely sure, so he didn't provide any further details. The story left me feeling both fascinated and uneasy. The Mothman, a creature of urban legend, had always been something I read about but never truly believed in. However, hearing my co-worker's account and the corroborations from his friends, I couldn't help but wonder if there was some truth to the legend. What was this winged creature that had appeared in Wilmington, and why was it circling my co-worker and his friends? I found myself looking up into the sky more often, scanning the horizon for any sign of the mysterious creature. The possibility that the Mothman was real sent a shiver down my spine, and I couldn't help but feel that the world was filled with more mysteries than I could ever truly comprehend. I want to share my story. Approximately five years ago I was driving home from my job as a correctional officer at Cook County Jail in Chicago, Illinois. My shift ended at 11 p.m. and it took me approximately 35-45 minutes to drive home from work. As I always did, 
I would call my wife and let her know I was safe for my shift and typically she would keep me company on my Bluetooth while I drove home. Every night when I drove home I took Midlothian Turnpike, a few blocks out the exit of the expressway. Midlothian Turnpike will also lead you to the location of Bachelors Grove Cemetery, please research Bachelors Grove Cemetery. As I drove past Bachelors Grove Cemetery, a figure which I can only describe as a pterodactyl flew over across my car and across the road into the woods on the other side of the street. I screamed, as I thought I was going to hit something. My wife is still on the phone now yelling asking me what is going on and if I was okay. I had to get my bearings together but I was so scared. I thought about stopping at the gas station ahead but I knew I was close to home. When I got home we got a good laugh about it. Two days ago I told this story to my boss. He asked if I knew what what Mothman was? I heard of it but wasn't familiar on its stories. When I look back now, many things happen that I believe may have been a result of my encounter. I probably won't talk about this again as I don't expect anyone to believe me and I don't want to feed it any energy to come back. Thank you for being open-minded. If any ohm here would like to know more or know someone who may want this info please message me here. Me, my uncle and my cousins went to this site to hunt deer. We lined up six abreast on the far side of the trench to push any deer out. As we walked along, I inadvertently got forced down into the trench. I then kept with the direction of the trench. After a short time I smelled something, it smelled like some stinking animal. Then I heard it running back and forth as if frantically looking for something. I could tell by the sound it was two-legged. I could feel the ground shake, like when a herd of elk gets spooked. At this point I hear a tree maybe 6 to 10 inches on the stump come crashing to the ground behind me. At this point I made extreme haste for the walls of the trench. Pulling on vines I made my way out and straight for our vehicles. I did not linger at the trench for further investigation. From all of my experience in the woods I can with full confidence say what I encountered was not a bear and was definitely two-legged. Hiking with a companion and two German shepherds around 9 am in the Rogumpqua wilderness saw a large brown object moving fast through the understory, which was quite thick. Dogs chased the object, both dogs had saddle packs, one dog had a tarp which was securely rolled and tied on the middle of his back. Dogs were gone about 3 to 5 minutes and came running back. One dog which had the tarp on returned and continued to run past us and ended up at the shelter, about 1 mile back where we had stayed the night and was extremely scared. The other older dog stopped when encountering us and listened when we told it to stop but was also very scared. Several things were unusual, the intense musty smell, something like a bull elk in heat but not or not like a bear either. The dogs fear as they have chased bears, coyotes, deer, elk and are never scared upon return. The tallness of the object as it was way too tall for a bear or elk. Too quiet for an elk also. The untied tarp which was securely tied but upon return of the chase the tarp was tied but just one knot. I tie good knots. It's important to the story to know that I was basically a huge jerk leading up to what happened. See, I'm a graduate student and I was at this point about 6 to 8 months into a new relationship with a woman named Sarah. If it matters, I am female and we were both around 30 at this time, the prior year, before I met Sarah, my best bud from school Josh and I had gone on a great camping slash road trip over spring break. This year, I messed up and basically double booked myself to go camping with Josh and with my girlfriend, because I am a scatterbrained idiot and I got confused about what plans had been discussed slash solidified. Both Josh and Sarah were justifiably really pissed off and hurt but I had made the plan with my girlfriend first, ultimately, so I had to flake on Joshua when it came time to planning. Sarah and I picked a campground in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of good hiking. It's at least a 5 hour drive from where we live. We made reservations and I mentioned the plan to Joshua well, 
It turns out, of all the campgrounds in the region, Josh had also decided to head to that one as it connected to a long bike trail he wanted to go on. He had decided to go camping alone, so we knew Josh would be at the campground before we got there, but things were super awkward between me and him, on account of my being an asshole and him being generally a bit depressed around that time. We stayed three nights and Josh was there for the first and second night. We'd rented out a small cabin, basically a prefab shed with bunk beds, because it was cheap and we have a leash reactive, wimpy about rain dog and it's sometimes easier that way. Josh was tent camping in another spot. I think Josh and I were mostly planning on avoiding each other, he was rightfully still angry, things were awkward and I figured he needed some space from me, but it turned out only one bathroom was open on our side of the campground. Since it was only early April and most of the campground was still closed down for the season. Josh's campsite was right next to the open bathroom, so we ended up seeing him when we walked to the bathroom at night. I saw slash heard signs of one or two other groups on the far side of the campground, but they had their own bathroom open over there and we never really saw them. It's a very large and forested campground and only small sections at either end were open for the season. The second night, Josh was out in his campsite when we came through to the bathroom before bed. It was after midnight at this point. Josh seemed super depressed and we had a very strange and awkward conversation with him, took care of what we needed to in the bathroom and headed back to our little shed, down the road. The roads in this part of the campground were basically like an inverted F, with the bathroom above the top of the F. In between the two arms of the F was a stand of trees next to the main road, a small, locked shower building and Josh's campsite, furthest from the main road, the main road being the vertical line of the F. We were staying off the main road further down on the opposite side. So that night we'd cut past Josh's camp to get to the bathroom but on the way back, we followed the road, so as not to bother him, as he seemed in a bad mood. It was dark and I'm easily spooked. We had the dog with us, which was somewhat reassuring, since he looks semi-tough, despite being a nutcase and a wimp. But I'm looking around nervously, and as I glance over my shoulder, I think I see a man off to the side of us. My brain processes this very slowly, as I just caught a glimpse of him as I turned my head, and it was very dark. I convinced myself my mind was playing tricks. I didn't look back and silently walked with Sarah and the dog back to our cabin. When we got back to the cabin, I thought Sarah looked a little spooked, which is unusual, since she's a lot braver than me. Eventually she says, that guy was really creepy, right? So shit. He was real. I told her I saw him but had convinced myself my eyes were playing tricks on me. But no. We both saw someone with no flashlight standing in the trees just off the road, maybe 15 feet from us. I asked if it might have been Joshua neither of us were really convinced, but wanted to convince ourselves so we could get some sleep. And he had been wandering around being moody 15 minutes before, and it was right by his campsite. I think we didn't want to freak ourselves out any further, so we locked the cabin and didn't talk about it much more. The next morning it was pouring rain so Josh decided to pack up and leave early instead of spending the day in the area. We shouted goodbye to him as we headed to the bathroom and he ran around tossing shit in his trunk and trying not to get drenched. That night was a weekend and there was a big family in the cabin next to ours and everything felt far less spooky. But when we got back to town a day later, I texted Josh, asking him if he'd been lurking creepily in the woods. He said no. Well, I told him what we'd seen and he said he'd seen a guy the prior night lurking in the woods without a flashlight. Same general description, which I'll get to, same area. The guy had really creeped him out, so much so that the next day he bought the biggest maglite he could find, so he'd have more than just a pocket knife to defend himself. But he'd also mostly convinced himself it was a park ranger. Yeah, with no flashlight, let alone a vehicle but he more or less willed himself to believe it so he could get some sleep. So, once we could no longer pretend it was Josh, Sarah and I compared notes. What we both saw, and what Josh saw the night before, was this, a tall, 
gaunt white man in his late 40s, with clean-shaven sunken cheeks, in the stand of trees slash bramble just off the road, in the space between the arms of the F. He was wearing a raincoat, rubber boots and a hat, and had no flashlight. He was just standing still and staring coldly in our direction. I remember his raincoat, his sunken face and how very cold his gaze felt. In contrast, Josh is several inches shorter than whoever we saw, was not wearing a raincoat that night, which we knew because we'd just seen him, but we convinced ourselves otherwise, bearded, 29 years old at the time, I should add, it wasn't raining. To be clear, where this guy was was not somewhere you'd be strolling through, it was a thick brambly area. He had made the effort to move out of the road and to stay in the shadows and away from the bright bathroom light, both nights. We're sure he wasn't going to the bathroom, though we were on the women's side, you can hear the men's side clearly and Josh had been outside in view of the bathroom doors both nights. He didn't look like he lived in the woods, which is to say, he appeared clean and groomed, and his clothes weren't worn or dirty. Whatever he may have been doing in the middle of the night in a nearly abandoned campground with no flashlight, he was clearly making an effort not to be seen. We all discussed it and Josh ultimately called the campground to let them know. They said they'd check it out. Although my camping fees were mysteriously refunded, we never heard anything more. Josh is still a little mad at me for seeing a potential murderer lurking the woods near his tent and not doing anything. Out of curiosity, we just checked to see if anything had happened in the park. A number of people have gone missing in the state park over the years, some slightly mysteriously. Most were found down river and believed to have fallen into the rapids on accident. I'm sure it's unrelated, but the whole place gives me the creeps. And I still can't figure out what that man was doing. As Lorna, park ranger of the Green Lakes National Park, my days were usually filled with the routine tasks of patrolling and maintaining the park. But that particular evening was different. I had been off duty, indulging in a spot of elk hunting near the old growth, an area dense with towering trees that had seen centuries pass by. The sun was gently sinking, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. It was my favorite time of the day in the park, a time when the hustle of the day eased, and the nocturnal orchestra started tuning up. The first scream pierced the peaceful dusk like a shard of glass. It was long, chilling, and unlike anything I'd ever heard in the park. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to decipher the source. It sounded distant, past a clear cut some 200 yards away. I gripped my hunting rifle tighter, my senses on high alert. The second scream came, then the third, each roughly 5 to 6 seconds long and spaced out over a span of 10 minutes. The sounds were loud, almost deafening, echoing through the otherwise quiet forest. It felt as if the forest held its breath, the usual chirping of birds and rustling of leaves replaced by an eerie silence. What intrigued me was not just the volume or the frequency of the screams but the pattern. It was as if whatever was making the sound was trying to communicate. The screams had a certain rhythm to them, an odd cadence that sounded like a kitty. As a park ranger, I was familiar with the cries and calls of the park's wildlife, but this was something new, something foreign. Every instinct told me to retreat, to get to the safety of the ranger station, but my curiosity pushed me forward. I moved stealthily, my boots crunching softly against the forest floor. The screams had stopped, replaced by an unsettling silence. I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up, a primal part of me acknowledging the unknown. As I neared the source of the sound, I took a deep breath, preparing myself for whatever was out there. The twilight had given way to the moon's pale glow, casting long, ominous shadows between the trees. I squinted, trying to make out any movement. But the forest stood still, as if it were holding its breath. Then, just as I was about to turn back, I saw it. In the clearing, bathed in the moonlight, was a creature. It was unlike anything I had seen before, a being straight out of a folk tale. As our eyes met, it let out a scream, the same chilling ah kitty that had led me here. I held my breath, 
my grip on the rifle tightening. That night, I came face to face with the unknown, and it changed my perspective forever. The park was not just a job anymore, it was a land of mysteries waiting to be discovered, and I was its custodian. The experience I'd like to share with you happened in the summer of 2002. I was 20, still living at home in a rental in East Mesa, Arizona with my 18-year-old brother and my mother. As you may know, Arizona has a typically six-month-long scorching, dry summer climate, and being a transplant from beautiful Northern Cali it was hard for us to adapt. Anyhow, it was a hot summer night in late May or early June. My brother had just graduated high school and I was working full-time during the day. We spent our evening talking and laughing and playing music, it really was a memorably enjoyable night. At about 10.30 I noticed that the front porch light had again burned out, as it had been doing for about 18 months prior to that. In fact, both of the lights over the driveway and three lights in our backyard were continually ceasing to function and it seemed I was always buying bulbs and expensive strobe light bulbs. I don't know if this is somehow connected to what happened next. First I must add that our front door was set back into the house with the garage protruding. Our front yard was much deeper than the backyard and was overshadowed by three velvet mesquite and a chinaberry tree, and various species of choya cacti. So the street light did little to penetrate the den of darkness. I turned the lamp light to my bedroom which was really an office nook right next to the front door, which had a large lattice picture window with run-of-the-mill blinds. I opened the blinds and the light flooded the wall of the garage. What I saw made my skin crawl. There on the stucco wall was something. It was only about 10 to 12 feet from where I was standing. The only way to describe it was that it looked like a giant headless moth. I called my brother over excitedly. I clearly remember our conversation. What do you suppose that is? I have no idea. It must be a bat of some sort. But we only have micro bats here in Arizona. And I have always heard that bats hang upside down. I guess it could be a giant moth. We do live in the desert. I thought moths were attracted to light. The lights are all burnt out again. We talked for a moment and stood next to the glass panes adjacent to the front door, the bedroom light illuminating all the while, and the thing did not stir or move. We decided it was about 18 inches to 2 feet long from blunt top to wing bottom. It was very clear yet very dark, almost black, and no antennae were visible. It hung on the wall like a moth but was about the size of a medium-sized fruit bat which I believe only exists in Asia. It was about five or six feet off the ground. My mother came and had a look and shuddered and refused to stand near the door. We were both young and curious and my brother said let's go have a look at it then. We swung the door and security screen open and he took a step over the door jam. I was suddenly struck with an unreal, unearthly fear and grabbed his shoulder. He looked back at me and later said I had the most wholly terrified look on my face that he had ever seen. I am afraid and tingly even writing this. Without a word, he stepped back inside and we locked both doors and closed the blinds and camped out in the living room, only going to sleep after several thoughtful conversations. The very next morning at sunrise I went out to the wall with a tape measure and my brother and mom stood at the door and directed me as to where and how high and how long this thing had been planted. There was no trace of anything, the dust on the stucco looked the same all around, with no residue or anything. When they were both satisfied with the positioning I read the tape measure, 28 inches. My mother walked back into the house and has absolutely refused to speak of it since. My brother and I are both keenly interested in animal slash insect slash plant life via books and media, and I have taken an MCC course in Southwest biology, and neither of us has ever seen or heard of anything matching its description. My husband was raised here and said the only thing he could think of that size was an owl, but this was no owl. What was it? Perhaps it is a real animal we could not identify. Has someone had a similar experience or know what it could be? We are not exaggerating people, we are level-headed and analytical. Thank you for your time.
on Thursday, May 4, 2023, between 6 to 7 p.m. in Snellville, Georgia. I was standing outside the police station and saw a shiny brown cigar-shaped object flying vertically northeast. It was moving smoothly and fast. I pulled my phone out and tried to get a video of it but it was hard to get it and had to look back at the sky. It was gone, as far as I know. What I could see was a large bird now flying around in circles. Later that night around 12 AM I was on the phone with a friend and the network cut off and was out for 30 minutes or so. It came back on and I was talking to my friend again and made the comment, either a UFO went by or a tower went down. Around 4 AM I got the feeling to lay in the bed and passed out immediately. I woke up at 8.35 AM and went to take a shower. I took my shirt off, which I was wearing when I fell asleep and had two sticky black circles on each side of my chest where my pecs meet my deltoids and collarbones. The shapes were round, 3 by 3 inches and the left one was a little smeared. It was sticky to the touch but wiped off easily with tissue, almost like it was dry and then I took a shower. I wanted to keep it but kept getting this subtle subconscious feeling not to and threw it away. Have you heard of anyone having a black residue left on their body? I've had many experiences starting in 1977 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It was kind of creepy seeing the circles but I was calm about it. I think it was for my own good. They've made it clear they don't like it when I talk too much or what I talk about but I know the time is there when I should. I'm from a real small town in Florida called Wewahichka. It's in Gulf County about 50 miles southwest of Tallahassee on the Panhandle. The area has lots of lakes and rivers. We lived on several acres in the middle of nowhere. We had dirt roads my whole childhood. At the time we had a single wide trailer. Lots of people in our community were complaining about an upright creature terrorizing them at night and stealing livestock and pets. My parents were city folks that moved into the area before I was born and opened a business so my parents told me it was just stories to scare us because we were outsiders. At the time when this happened, I was 14 years old and I had a younger brother that was 5 years old. One night in October 2004 my dad and I were watching TV. My brother was in bed. My mom was in the kitchen. We had one bedroom and I had to pass the kitchen and my brother's room to get to the bathroom. My brother was sitting up in bed and he was crying. I tried to console him because I didn't want to get him in trouble for not sleeping. He whispered to me a man was looking in his window. I looked out the window and to my horror I see a pair of yellow glowing eyes watching us. So I grabbed my brother up. I knew my dad was in the living room and he kept a gun on the kitchen counter. I yelled to my dad that some sicko was looking in the window at my brother. Just then I saw his whole face. It looked like a Neanderthal man with long brown hair and it looked terrifying. His face was at the bottom of the window. I saw this massive chest and abdomen. It must have been 9 feet tall. My dad burst out on the front porch with a gun in his hand and he fires several times. It looked at my dad for a moment then ran for the tree line. My dad then came in and my mother and brother were crying because of the sound of the 44 Magnum. My parents told me to go to bed and to take my brother with me. I overheard my parents talking. They didn't call the cops because they didn't know what it was. It was not human. My mother told my father tomorrow I want all the trees gone, not a single one taller than you can stay. He reluctantly agreed. He called in every friend and every favor and had seven acres removed by sundown on Saturday. I had two friends close in age. One lived a mile away and the other two miles away. The closest came down that Saturday morning and I asked him if he heard the gunshots the night before. I told him it was my dad. My mother came out and told me to stay out of the woods. She was going into town with my brother to buy curtains and blinds which was something we really didn't need before. But since this happened we put curtains up. After my mother pulled away we got our friends and I guess they basically pulled together their friends so they could go look. So we grabbed our guns and our machete. We knew the woods really well. We backtracked my yard and picked up on a trail. 
We spotted blood at the tree line. My father was washing away blood from the side of the mobile home and so we went back into the woods following the blood. As we walked we came across a crude shelter with the remains of what looked like trash. This thing was stealing trash and taking it to this little crude shelter. We followed the trails for hours. We heard a howl and a scream like no other we'd heard before. My father must have heard it and grabbed his buddies and they raced into the woods with their guns in hand. They looked terrified when we finally crossed paths. He said they saw the blood trail and asked what we found. We told them about the shelter and we took them where we'd been. We had been so keen on following the trail we had never noticed the carcasses of deer and dogs high in the trees. My father chopped down the shelter and urinated all over it. One of his friends said that they had to mark to take back our land. It sounded crazy but I looked up to this man and he seemed to know what he was talking about. The six of us made a pact that it was a bear and to never talk about it again. As we moved back to our house we heard the howl again and it was mad. It sounded closer this time. Our fathers told us to run. The three of them were side by side firing at something. Of course, we didn't go far. Whatever it was died that afternoon. My dad told me to get a few shovels and be quick about it. We didn't want anyone to see a thing. I was the only one they let approach it because I had already seen it through the window. We took turns digging the hole. It was a big foot, nine feet or taller and so wide. I could not jump over it. It was a male. His face was all shot up, but its upper lip was five inches from the base of his nose to the opening. Its arms were as big as my dad's legs. His fingers were as wide as coke cans. Its feet were longer than the barrel of my shotgun. We buried it and left for my house. Our mothers were waiting for us and frantically asked what it was. We said that it was a bear and it was injured so we put it down and buried it. We didn't want to get in trouble with the game warden. That's what we told him and I think my mother knew the truth but it was best not said. Back in 1993, my mom, older sister, and I were at the public storage in Hoffman Estates, Illinois putting some things into storage. It was in the evening but it was pretty lit up at the facility. Behind the storage was a big wooded area. There we saw a white grayish creature staring at us. We were shaken with fear. It was across the field so it was a little of a distance away. But even though it was that far away it was tall and manlike. My sister screamed so loud after her initial shock wore off and this thing turned around and leapt over the fence and landed on the other side on two feet and then ran into the woods. This fence was about six to eight feet high at least. So we knew this thing was not human. It was pretty scary. We told everyone about it. People joked of course but to us, it was no laughing matter. It scared us so much that my mom had the movers move all of my sister's stuff out of that storage. We were convinced that we saw some sort of Bigfoot. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving and Lee was camping in the Ozark National Forest in Arkansas trying to get a deer for Thanksgiving in the freezer. It was an annual tradition for Lee to venture into the same woods he hunted with his dad every year before he died. These woods were where his dad taught him to leave no trace, to respect the sacred place, and to always give, thanks when it gave up its gifts. Going without his dad this year didn't feel right, but his wife encouraged him to keep the tradition. Lee finished up his sandwich, cleaned up camp, grabbed his gear, and started walking into the woods. The leaves crunched under his feet and the sweet smell of forest decay and moist dirt was in the air. Reaching his favorite clearing alongside a creek didn't take too long. He set his pack down and started checking the game trails leading to the clearing from the forest deciding which way he would go next. Once he made up his mind, he returned to his pack, pulled out an apple, and left it on the rock in the center of the clearing before heading down the game trail. He remembered the first time he went hunting with his dad and saw him leave a pile of apples. It was always Arkansas black apples from their tree back at home his dad told him that when the forest gives you a gift it's only fitting to leave a gift as well. 
It felt mystical as a child but now that Lee was a grown man he believed that apples were like his dad's lucky pair of hunting underwear. His dad was very successful hunting deer, and always seemed to show up near him. So he decided to keep the tradition, at least the apple part. His dad took his lucky underwear to the grave. Lee started chuckling as he walked along the creek when he recalled the horrified look on the mortician's face when he handed her the lucky underwear they were patched with many pieces of fabric over the years, often flowery remnants of his sister's dresses. His dad may have been a mountain man but he was buried with roses on his rear end. His chuckle had turned to a laugh when suddenly a red fox ran past him and a rock landed on the ground in front of him rolling forward on the ground. He gripped his rifle tighter as he turned around to confront whoever threw the rock. He couldn't see anyone nearby so he lifted his rifle to his shoulder and started looking in the direction the rock had come from through his scope. Near the entrance to the clearing, partially behind the large oak, was a large figure. A little scared but mostly angry Lee yelled hey at the figure. The figure stepped out from behind the tree and Lee realized what he was looking at. In his sight was a creature standing on two legs covered in shaggy brown hair. It was clearly a male and had broad massive shoulders that led to a head with tiny neck in between. He could see the creature's eyes blinking through the scope. He was sure he wasn't looking at a human, but he still asks why'd you do that? The creature bellowed a strange roar louder and different than any noise he had ever heard in these woods before. Lee's hands were shaking as he watched the creature through his scope. The thought came to his mind this is your chance. He tried to be a good provider for his family but there was usually more month left than paycheck. If he shot this creature he was guaranteed a payday. There had even been a TV show offering a huge bounty for just a little proof. A body would be worth more. They could replace his wife's death trap of a car, college savings for the kids, and fewer trips to the thrift store. Just one shot and they would finally have their heads above water. His father's reminders about only taking what you need whisper in his mind. Lee took a deep breath, whispered I need this aim center mass, and pulled the trigger. The creature grunted and screamed as it grabbed at its side. He could see the blood dripping between its fingers as it turned and ran. The creature wasn't running very fast but it maintained its distance from Lee. It crossed over a river and climbed up the limestone cliff running along the river, climbing into the mouth of a bluff shelter. Lee knew he would be at a disadvantage if he tried to climb up to the bluff shelter but he couldn't see into the shelter from his location on the ground. He backed up and watched the creature in the shelter through his scope. It was too far away to take a second shot so he stayed there observing the creature's actions. Lee could see the creature leaning against the side of the shelter taking deep breaths. If the creature died there the body would be safe. He had been watching for about 10 minutes through his scope when he noticed a grey figure at the creature's side. He could see grey arms moving as the wounded creature was gesturing toward the wound area. The grey figure put its hand down on the wound and the creature screamed in pain. Lee felt a twinge of guilt, feeling sorry for the pain the wounded creature was suffering. Oh God, why didn't I get a clean shot, he thought. The wounded creature sat down and put its back against the shelter wall. From the opposite side of the shelter, he saw another dark figure approach the wounded creature and fall to its knees. It rested its hands on the wounded one's legs. Its lips move as if talking. It stood back up and turned around as a small figure ran up to it. It leaned down to pick up the smaller figure and Lee could see pendulous breasts hanging. He realized this was a female, a mother. Lee lowered his gun trembling with the realization of what he had done. I shot the father. I may have killed this little one's father. Guilt washed over him. He would never do anything illegal to help his family financially but he couldn't shake the feeling that what he had done was akin to murder. This mother was picking up her child just like his wife picked up theirs. This mother appeared concerned about the wounded creature just like his wife would be. If they had no shaggy hair someone might even confuse them with humans. I'm a murderer. What was I thinking? He dropped to his knees. Lee looked back up through his scope and saw the wounded one standing up again. A mass of leaves where the wound was. 
The mother was cradling the young one's head on her shoulder. Both were looking down at him. Emotions overwhelmed him as tears ran down his face. He knew his dad was looking down on him too. He set his gun down and put his face in his hands. He was no better of a man than a poacher. He cried until the tears wouldn't come anymore, then stood up. When he looked up at the bluff shelter there was nothing there. He lifted his rifle back up and looked through the scope. Nothing. He scanned the rest of the area along the limestone cliff and river but the family was gone. He lowered his gun and turned away walking back the way he came. He knew he had made one of the biggest mistakes of his life but he also couldn't shake the idea that this was just a bad dream. He walked back to the clearing where he had left the apple on the rock. Even from the clearing he could see the white flesh exposed against the deep red skin of the apple. A single bite was missing and there was a trail of blood near the rock. He walked out of the woods sick knowing that what had happened was real. Lee would return to these woods every year unarmed with a pile of Arkansas black apples and an apology. Wildlife would dart through the clearing past him but he refused to hunt at this location anymore. He had violated the trust his dad had built and he wanted to build it back for his own kids. Lee didn't know for certain if his dad knew about these creatures existing but Lee had a feeling he did. His dad's patchwork flowery lucky underwear would always be a mystery, but he finally understood the importance of his dad's gift of apples. One night, years ago, I was hanging out with my now ex-boyfriend. It was either November or December of 2019. We decided that night that we wanted to look at the stars. It was very cold out and probably around 1 AM, but that did never stop us from going outside. We put on extra layers, grabbed a blanket, and laid out to look at the stars. Most of the night we were having fun, laughing, and talking. There was one point where our conversation got very serious. He started explaining to me that he didn't believe in God. Or anything at all. He believes nothing will happen when we die. My response to that was I respect his beliefs but I believe in God. I know something will happen when we die. I've witnessed too many spiritual things in my life not to believe. I've always had a knowing that something more is out there. His only response was once he sees something, he'll believe it. We were quiet for a while after that, but eventually continued talking about other things and having fun. That's when I saw something in the sky. What I saw was a massive pair of wings gliding directly above me. It was at least 18 to 20 feet. I couldn't make out a head, legs, or tail. Just a massive pair of wings. It was dark and hard to see but the wings had a subtle glow just enough for me to see it. It almost looked see-through but also glowing. It can't be for sure though. It was a shocking thing to see. I wasn't necessarily horrified, but I was in complete awe. I didn't feel anything negative. My ex wasn't paying attention at first. I shouted at him to look up. When he did, he immediately started panicking. He was swearing and freaking out. The pair of wings wasn't there for long. It just flew above us, then above my house, and seemed to disappear or just fade into the darkness. As it was flying, it only flapped its wings once. So really it was gliding. My ex grabbed me and insisted we go inside. He was horrified. We didn't get much sleep that night. Eventually, the next day after calming down, we decided we wanted to go out at night again and see if anything else happens. There was a lot more that happened, I won't get into too much detail about. We saw strange UFOs and two big bright lights that appeared to be close to us so bright that it was hard to see. That itself was very scary and unusual. But the strangest thing was the wing being thing. After this happened my perspective of life changed completely. There is so much out there that we don't know about. Not that it's related, but weird things started happening around the world too. Pandemic, Ukraine, Chinese spy balloon, and so much more. There is just so much happening. I have searched and talked to so many people to see if maybe they experienced something similar but I can't find much information. I do believe that maybe what I saw was an angel. Or could be an interdenominational being. 
I'm not sure. I don't think I'll ever know for sure. I've accepted that. Again, as unbelievable as it sounds, this is something real that has happened to me, and my ex-boyfriend. Not too long ago, while hunting near Saddle Mountain close to Beatty, my hunting party had heard and smelled something eerie. Loud screams, not dissimilar to those of a large bear, echoed through the quiet woods. The eerie part was that there were no big bears in these parts. Those gut-wrenching screams were still etched in my memory, playing out like a nightmare I couldn't shake off. Then came the silence. The unsettling silence continued, the unusual smell growing stronger. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. It was a fleeting shadow at first, but as I focused my gaze, it became clear that it was a large, upright figure standing on the edge of the woods. It was massive, towering over the tallest trees, silhouetted against the faintly glowing evening sky. I squinted, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. The figure had a distinct, humanoid shape but was covered head to toe in thick, dark fur. It stood there for a moment, its eyes glowing in the dim light, seemingly observing us. Bigfoot. It had to be. I kept my eyes on the creature until we safely backtracked. Although the encounter was brief and somewhat frightening, it was also utterly fascinating. My hunting troop told me that we needed to shoot it, but I was against such an idea. I think they're more human-like than we think. The legend of the skinwalker has always sent shivers down my spine. As a member of the Algonquin tribes, it's a tale I've heard countless times. It speaks of a sinister entity that can take the form of any creature it desires. It's said to be an evil witch, punished for using forbidden magic and doomed to roam the earth, sowing discord and feeding on fear. In our tribe, the skinwalker and the wendigo are often spoken of in the same breath. Both are embodiments of our darkest fears. The Wendigo, a creature born of insatiable greed and cannibalism, is a grim reminder of the dangers of letting our desires overcome us. Despite the passing of generations, the terror these entities evoke remains ever-present, a shadow cast upon our people, especially when venturing into the vast, untamed wilderness of our ancestral lands. Not long ago, a group of ten friends, outsiders all of them, decided to camp in these very woods. They crossed paths with me on their way. I noticed their excitement, their laughter echoing through the trees, a stark contrast to the quiet reverence we natives held for this land. I felt it was my duty to warn them about the legends, about the skinwalker and wendigo that lurked in our folklore. Their response was nothing short of mockery. They laughed it off, joking about these fairy tales, their voices filled with youthful arrogance. I watched them go, a sinking feeling in my heart. Their first night was filled with joy, but as the days passed, their laughter faded, replaced by an eerie silence. The tranquil forest began to whisper tales of terror. They reported strange noises, horrifying visions, and an unsettling feeling of being watched. Then, one by one, they began to disappear. Despite the growing fear, they refused to leave, their pride blinding them to the direness of their situation. One night, after the last embers of their campfire had died out, they all vanished. It was I who found their abandoned campsite. Hence torn apart, their belongings scattered haphazardly, and a chilling silence hanging in the air. Search parties were formed, and after days of combing the forest, we found them. Their lifeless bodies were a grim testament to their hubris. The legend of the skinwalker and the wendigo is not just a story, it's a warning, a lesson about respect and humility. These friends learned it too late. Their fate serves as a chilling reminder to all who dare to venture into these woods, ignorant and dismissive of the ancient spirits that dwell within. It was back in the early summer of 1991, mid-June or perhaps early July, that something truly strange happened on my family's 300-acre property, located about a mile north of Cape Perpetua, near the coast of Yahats, Oregon. 
I was driving down our private access road. There were some hikers further ahead, enjoying the tranquility of the dense woods surrounding us. That tranquility was abruptly shattered when a massive creature darted across the road in front of them, disappearing into the underbrush as quickly as it had appeared. I can still remember how the sight of it took my breath away. It was enormous, about nine feet tall, covered in long, brown hair. But what was most astounding was the speed at which it moved. One moment, it was there, standing in stark contrast to the lush green of the forest, and in the blink of an eye, it was gone, swallowed by the foliage. No sound accompanied its passage, no rustling of the leaves, no crackling of the twigs beneath its weight, and there was no distinctive odor that lingered in its wake. The creature left behind a single, blurred footprint. I didn't bother to measure it, the details of the print were far too vague to make out any useful information. But the sight of it, so striking in its alien quality, cemented the reality of what I'd just witnessed. The sighting occurred in the late afternoon, around 4 p.m., with plenty of summer daylight left. At my nearby trailer, I kept four dogs, all chained to prevent them from wandering off into the wilderness. Despite their keen senses, they'd show no signs of being disturbed by any unusual presence in the forest. Intrigued and more than a little unnerved, my father and I decided to explore the area where the creature had vanished. There, deep within the forest, we discovered a small pile of oyster shells. They didn't seem old enough to be remnants of an old Indian shell mound, despite those being common in coastal areas. Confused and fascinated, I decided to share my experience with a friend of mine, a park ranger named Tim. He was a seasoned man, someone who had spent years patrolling the dense woods and had seen more than his share of wildlife. Despite being initially skeptical, Tim listened to my story and agreed to investigate the unusual find of oyster shells. I'm not sure what I expected him to say. Maybe I hoped he would confirm my suspicion about having seen Bigfoot, or perhaps dismiss it as an encounter with a rogue bear. But Tim, with his calm demeanor and sharp eyes, simply stated, the woods hold more secrets than we can fathom, Steve. We might never know what truly happened here, but that's okay. It's part of the magic. Back in August of 2000, I witnessed something I still struggle to believe. I'm Jason Schaffer, a detective, and I'm about to share a peculiar encounter I had around 1.53 am. During a pursuit of three suspicious men in a vehicle. Blocking my path in the middle of the road was an 8-9 to nine foot tall upright figure. I slammed on the brakes and stepped out of my car, needing to reassure myself that I wasn't seeing things. As soon as I did, the creature bolted, probably at a speed of 40-50 to 50 miles an hour, and was clear across the highway in a blink. For more than half an hour after this encounter, I couldn't stop my hands from shaking so much that I couldn't even hold a cup of coffee. That location has been off my travel routes ever since. Many speculate that the entity I saw was some form of Bigfoot, but given the lack of other reported sightings at the time, I can't definitively say that's what it was. However, I've heard numerous accounts of what's being termed shadow people around the Atlanta area. This leads me to believe that many folks aren't reporting their encounters due to fear of ridicule or humiliation. Some may not even recognize the existence of these entities. I'm convinced there are countless people who've experienced paranormal phenomena without realizing it, due to a lack of prior knowledge about these occurrences. That's the reason I'm sharing my story here. Feel free to share my experience with your friends and family, but I urge you to keep an open mind. Thanks for taking the time to read about my encounter. I've got this buddy who spent a few years working as a forest ranger in the US. He has spun some spine-chilling yarns about his findings on the job, leading me to a startling realization, either all forest rangers are in cahoots, sharing elaborately conceived tales for anyone curious about their work, or the wilderness is a trove of more mysteries than we can fathom. 
One tale that continues to occupy my mind rent-free is about this bizarre pit he discovered deep in the forest. He mentioned receiving reports about an excavated pit that fellow rangers had stumbled upon while patrolling, just a gigantic, gaping hole in the middle of the woods. Being the curious type, he decided to investigate, and sure enough, he found the pit. A cavity in the earth about the size of a car, with an oddity at its center. A vintage record player in seemingly perfect condition. My buddy brought the relic back to the office, and the rest of the team filled the pit in. The record player became a forgotten mystery when no one came forward to claim it. A week later, they faced a reprimand from their superiors for failing to fill the pit, news that left my friend bewildered. He knew he and his colleagues had done so. However, they were met with undeniable evidence to the contrary when they returned to the site. The pit was there, untouched, without a trace of the soil they had used to fill it. The only change? A vintage cigarette case now lay in its center. My friend once again filled the pit, half assuming that there was some mischief at play, maybe some ritualistic actions. But it didn't add up. Again, nobody inquired about the cigarette case. So, naturally, he kept it. Days later, reports came in, the pit was back. The rangers were tired of the games. They took a small security camera with them, intent on catching the pit excavator. What they found this time was a small, old, leather-bound notebook. They installed the camera, filled the pit, and left. The pit never returned. Whoever was digging it seemed to have been scared off by the camera. However, the curious part wasn't over. My friend had the collected items examined, confirming their authenticity and remarkable condition. A peculiar way for a vintage collector to store their treasures. But the strangest discovery was in the journal, a newspaper clipping dated April 17, 1972, and one cryptic phrase, it worked. Another story involves a kid who emerged from the woods one day. He was slightly dirty, standard for a child after a day's play. Clad in a t-shirt and jeans, there was nothing odd about his appearance. The rangers found him and took him to one of their offices to inquire about his parents, his presence there. He said he had lost his family while chasing a beetle in the woods. The kid seemed normal, but he had a unique accent, making English sound like a well-learned second language. When asked for his parents' names, he replied with K98 and D54. They probed for their real names, but he just kept repeating those alphanumeric sequences, confused by their questions. They tried to ask him for his parents' contact numbers, how long he had been lost, or any other identifying details, but to no avail. All the questions seemed foreign to him. Suddenly, the boy announced that he had made a severe mistake, bolted from the office, and disappeared into the forest. The rangers pursued him, but he was too swift. They searched the forest extensively but found no trace of him. Search and rescue teams were summoned, missing posters were distributed, social media shares were circulated, and the police even got involved at some point. But the child was never seen or heard from again. After searching extensively and covering as much terrain as possible, they found nothing, not even a footprint. Everyone braced for the inevitable moment when worried parents would show up asking about their missing child. But no one ever came. As time passed, the search efforts waned. The boy's story became a missing person's report with only a generic physical description to go by and the unusual names of his alleged parents, K98 and D54. Among the rangers, it became somewhat of a taboo topic. Nobody wanted to ponder the grim possibilities of where a child lost in the woods might have ended up. Yet, even with the scant hope of ever uncovering the truth, my friend holds a firm belief, that boy was not merely lost, but somehow purposefully placed in the woods. He entertains the possibility that the kid might have been a product of an extraterrestrial entity masquerading as his parents. It's a peculiar case indeed and one shrouded in an aura of suspicious activity. After the search died down, any mention of the incident on social media was pulled down. Documentation that had been released was suddenly redacted. 
Everything about the case, to this day, reeks of fishiness. But these are just two tales from my friend's time as a forest ranger. There's no shortage of eerie stories he's shared with me over the years, and whether it's all a grand inside joke amongst rangers, or the woods truly hold inexplicable mysteries, I may never know. All I do know is that his accounts have left me with a newfound sense of wonder, and a dash of unease, about what lies hidden in the depths of our forests. One August, I ventured into the dense woods near the Three Sisters Wilderness with a rather unique friend of mine, Roy. You see, Roy claims to be a psychic who can communicate with Bigfoot. Yes, Bigfoot. He lives his life in a way that echoes the habits of this elusive creature and has had what he calls great success with it. His house, he once told me, was brimming with documentation. He didn't care for publicity or approval, he knew Bigfoot was real, and that was all that mattered to him. As we ventured deeper into the forest, Roy began to speak out loud to the air around us. He claimed he was communicating with Bigfoot, saying, he's a friend of mine. You can trust him. He's not going to hurt you, referring to my presence. For 15 minutes, Roy spoke, and with each pause, a series of chirps answered him from the dense foliage. Chirp, chirp. It echoed through the silent woods. According to Roy, the chirping sounded as though it were originating from some sort of cavity. While I stood there, trying to wrap my mind around this peculiar conversation, Roy mentioned his friend Everett. Everett apparently serenades Bigfoot with songs on his guitar. I found myself wondering what sort of tunes Bigfoot prefers. Once we returned to our old-style ranch pickup, Roy was astounded by the plethora of footprints surrounding it. His only response to my obvious shock was a smug, I told you they were here. Despite his claim of communication, Roy never saw Bigfoot that day. We explored further and discovered a large area where the trees were entirely stripped of their bark and leaves. It was an eerie sight. Roy didn't know what kind of trees they were, but he theorized that Bigfoot had stripped and eaten all the bark and leaves. As evidence, he showed me a patch of young cedar trees near what he called Bigfoot Mountain, where the bark had been similarly stripped away. Even though I never witnessed Bigfoot myself, that peculiar adventure with Roy in the woods was something I will never forget. It made me question what I thought I knew about the world and opened my mind to the mysteries that might still be hiding within the depths of our forests. I was a cop for 27 years, which kind of brings me to what I experienced last year in Barrett's Montana. As a cop, I approach things with open-minded cynicism. In other words, I like evidence. I want to see it, touch it, feel it, test it, and then make my decision. I retired from the department three years ago. I'm from Northern Arizona. I decided I needed a second career. I taught school for a semester and really didn't like it. On a fluke my best friend and competitive shooting buddy said let's go to truck driving school, so we did. We drove as a team and spent all of last winter in the mountain states, running from Phoenix, Arizona, near where I live, to Shelby, Montana. We used to overnight in Barrett's, Montana at a Sinclair station with a cafe, a small store, and parking for about 20 semis. It was a regular stop for us, so I was familiar with the area. We stopped this night and I was in the driver's seat. My buddy was sitting on the lower bunk in the sleeper. We had a movie on the DVD player and I was paying half attention to that and half attention to my laptop when I caught some movement past the driver's window. Bear in mind this is a small facility and it is 100 yards from the freeway but generally surrounded by a large field with 3 to 4 foot tall grass and thicket that goes right into foothills and mountains. I looked in the mirror and saw the biggest presumed man I had ever seen step behind my trailer which was about 70 feet behind me. I said, Jesus, that's the biggest mfer I've ever seen. Damn. My buddy popped up and looked out the passenger mirror. It walked between the space between the rear of our trailer and a truck that was parked next to us. 
I didn't think any more of it for a while but then realized that when I caught the movement next to me the head of the guy was nearly at my shoulder level which was 10 feet off the ground. I was in my 2019 Freightliner Cascadia tractor. The bottom of the window line of my door is 9 and a half feet from ground level. My cop brain went into assessment mode and I thought it couldn't have been that tall. There must have been a shadow casting on my window. I wasn't even considering Sasquatch. I was tired and put it out of my mind. I finished up and my partner and I went back to our bunks and killed the TV. The only noise is from my heater running. I fell into a very light sleep which was unusual because I usually sleep like a baby. I'm totally comfortable in my truck but not this night. It's like I felt like I was hovering between sleep and wakefulness. Around midnight I really had to pee since the cafe was already closed by 9 p.m. I climbed out of the passenger side of my tractor. For some reason, I felt like I was being hunted or watched. Maybe not actively hunted like prey but I definitely was aware of something predatory being aware of me. I've been hunted by criminals and I've been around predatory animals but I have never felt like this before. I finished quickly and looked around and scanned the grass field in the quarter moonlight and had a deep down feeling that I should not move toward the field. My instincts signaled that danger existed. I got back into the truck and locked the door. I felt like there was something out there that was dangerous but only if I did something to trigger an aggressive response. I got back into my bunk and made sure that my Glock 10 pistol was in the cubby by my head. Being a retired police officer I could legally carry in all 50 states but I also made sure two spare magazines were close to hand as well. I tried to put it out of my mind and listen to a podcast while trying to go back to sleep. I slept a little bit but I had a sense of foreboding. At 3 am I bolted upright reaching for my Glock. I saw it, whatever it was, go by the front of the truck, this time in the space between the building and my truck. I moved out of my bunk to the passenger side window and only caught a faint and fading shadow moving into the darkness out of the faint glow of the low sodium lighting on the building 75 yards away. There was no way I was going back to sleep. I got my coffee maker and started a pot of coffee and got dressed. I still had 90 minutes on my electronic log before I could go back on duty and drive us out of there. But all I wanted to do was leave ASAP. I kept looking up the windows of the truck but I didn't see anything else. The sun started coming up and with the light, the sense of foreboding retreated. I could see all around the truck and the few other trucks parked in the lot and out into the grass field and up to the building. My buddy asked why I was up so early. I told him what I had felt all night and he quietly said, me too. When the sun was fully up I walked all around the places where I'd seen it. I was using my cop brain again and realized that the hard packed gravel would hold no tracks especially as cold as it was. I walked to the edge of the grass field and there was a trail. It was a game trail where I'm sure deer moved through. There were no large footprints visible. When the cafe opened for breakfast my buddy and I went in to eat. We tried to figure out what we'd experienced and seen. I am firmly convinced that I saw a Sasquatch. I took the known and the unknown and the puzzle pieces and put them into one logical assumption that could be made. At any rate, we decided to put a day of driving between us and Barrett's and get to a larger truck stop or terminal. My name is Sam, and I've been a park ranger at the nearby Thompsonville National Park in Illinois for nearly a decade now. I've seen and experienced a lot in my years out in the wild, from the spectacular beauty of a sunrise over the mountains to the unexpected encounters with all sorts of wildlife. But nothing quite prepared me for the day I crossed paths with the enigmatic creature known as Bigfoot. It was a typical morning when I received a call from old Bill, a farmer who lived at the edge of the park. Bill had found some odd tracks on his property and wanted me to come take a look. Intrigued. I hopped into my ranger vehicle and drove over to Bill's farm. The tracks were indeed unusual, enormous footprints with distinct toe imprints, much larger than any humans and deeper than any native animals could possibly make. I remembered some of the stories I'd heard around campfires and in whispered conversations, 
Tales of a creature called Honey Bear, a nickname given due to its fondness for honey and its bear-like size. Some said it was just another term for Bigfoot. Curiosity peaked, I decided to delve deeper. For the next few weeks, I ventured out into the woods, camera in hand, on the trail of the mysterious honey bear. I found more tracks, some broken branches high up in the trees, and once even stumbled upon a partially eaten honeycomb, discarded near a creek. One day, while I was inspecting some claw marks on a tree, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. A low growl echoed around me. I turned slowly, and there, not ten feet away, was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was tall, with shaggy, brown fur and a hulking form, easily towering over me. I could barely breathe as I slowly lifted my camera, but just as I was about to snap a photo, the creature turned and disappeared into the forest with a speed that belied its size. All that was left was the rustling of leaves and a sense of awe. Whether or not what I saw was the legendary Bigfoot or the honey bear of local lore, I couldn't say for sure. But I can tell you this, there's more to the wilderness than we know, and sometimes, the mysteries are what make it truly magical. This happened to me a few years back. I live in a suburban neighborhood that borders a large park, part of which is public and the rest is a closed-off reservoir. The public section of the park is sprawling over several acres, there are hiking trails in the woods, a baseball field, basketball and tennis courts, and a playground area. The park is accessible by car via a winding one-lane road that goes through the playground area and around to more remote sections in the woods. Eventually, this road leads out to a major, busy highway. At one point, it was used as a cut through to get from the highway to my neighborhood and beyond. Nowadays, there are several much larger access points to the neighborhood and the cut through is seldom used. My story begins on a late winter afternoon. I was spending the day at home with my now ex-husband, who was an avid runner. He decided to go out on foot into the park to take a run down the one lane road. He did this often and the crime rate in this area is extremely low, so I thought nothing of it. After about an hour or so, he comes back all sweaty. I asked him how the run went and his time per mile, etc. He tells me he was slower than usual that day and just wasn't feeling very well during the run. As he's heading to the shower to rinse off, he casually says oh, I heard this dog whimpering in the woods when I was running. I am a bleeding heart for wounded animals and asked him for more specifics. He said he had not gone to look for the whimpering dog because the noise had stopped shortly after it started. He then said the last thing we need is another pet and went off to shower. I sat there for a bit, looking at my three dogs laying on the floor and lazily pawing at each other. After a few moments, I couldn't stand it anymore so I laced up some tennis shoes, grabbed some treats and headed to my car. My husband was just getting out of the shower by then and I told him I was going to look for the dog. He said I was crazy but didn't try to stop me, nor did he want to go back out with me. By now, daylight was fast fading and it was close to 5.30 pm. The spot he'd heard the whimpering was about 2 minutes from our house. I drove over and pulled my car into the shoulder, so as not to block the lane. I got out and started calling for the dog here doggy and other similar phrases to see if it had start whimpering again or come out to greet me. I heard nothing, so after a minute or so, I decided to venture out into the woods. The woods in this area of the park are not too dense, with trees spaced at least 8 to 10 feet apart on average and the forest floor was blanketed with fallen leaves. Every step I made was a loud crunch. I'd stop call out and be still for a bit, and then slowly move further into the woods. I thought I could hear a dog whimper once or twice but it always happened as I was calling out, so I couldn't be sure. The further I walked, the less light there was and the more dense the trees became. I had brought my cell phone but this one didn't have a flashlight app at the time. I'd been out there walking, calling, and stopping for about 20 minutes when I came upon a small clearing. 
I've always been fascinated by the occult but all the stories I'd read did not prepare me for what I saw in that clearing. The first thing that caught my eye was this formation of sticks laid out on the ground. The sticks were all of the same size and formed a small circle. Inside the circle, there were three more sticks propped up in a tripod formation in the center. On top of the tripod was a small doll's head with the eyes missing from their sockets. I immediately had this OF moment where I realized that I was a woman alone in the woods at dusk, with no form of protection on me, and in a spot where I clearly was not meant to be. I froze in place as I surveyed the surroundings. To make myself less scared, I called out again softly this time come here puppy. There were small bones in a pile at the far edge of the clearing. A bush to my left had several more gouged that doll's heads hanging from the branches. It was not windy that day but I swear I heard the rustling of leaves that last time I called out for the lost dog. As I scanned the perimeter from left to right, my eyes suddenly fixed for a split second across the clearing on something in the trees. There, about 8 to 10 feet back in the bushes was a man's face. I kept my eyes moving because something told me not to let him know I'd seen him by staring or reacting in any way. The brief moment I glanced at him was enough to momentarily paralyze me. His hair was long and unkempt, his eyes were bulging almost as he stared at me. I couldn't see the rest of him because of the tree cover. At this point, my flight response finally kicked in and I was able to move again. I remember saying something to the effect of silly dog must have found his way home as I started to back out of the clearing, still scanning. He didn't appear to be pursuing me, so as soon as I was half hidden by trees on my side, I took off running at full speed to my car. I couldn't tell how long it took or how far it was but daylight was all but gone by now. I somehow made it back to the road, a few yards behind where my car was parked. I sprinted to it and locked myself inside. It took me four attempts to get my key in the ignition with how badly my hands were trembling. I finally got the car started and beat it the hell out of there. Took the long way home to my house by going out to the main highway and entering my neighborhood through another well-traveled intersection. As soon as I was home, I called the police to report what I'd seen. They never followed up with me. The more I've thought on this over the years, I'm convinced that the man in the woods was the one whimpering, to lure a gullible victim like me off the little road and into the woods. I was working as an information technology contractor for MGM Studios during the year 2000. It was a lot of fun working there, getting to see movie props such as the Stargate was an extra bonus. I was staying at the Georgian Hotel in Santa Monica during a major renovation. Having worked at MGM for a month, my contract was coming to an end. During my last night at the hotel, I woke up suddenly at approximately 3 a.m. via the light from the window and the night light in the room, I could see something floating in the middle of the room. It was the head of something I'd never seen and never want to see again. It was grotesque, a man's head with snakes as hair. Its skin, which looked dark green, seemed to be moving with smaller snakes. As I watched it, it moved its lips as if it was trying to talk to me, but I couldn't hear anything. I could see the back of its head in the mirror on the wall in front of me. I really don't know how I knew to say this but I told him, it wasn't welcome and he had to leave. After saying this a few more times, it just slowly faded away. I got up and turned on the lights in the room. Working for MGM, I thought maybe one of the guys I was working with was playing a joke on me. I checked the whole room for anything that could produce this head image but I found nothing. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep. When the time came to check out later that morning, I was too embarrassed to say anything. Heading into work one last time, I did ask the guys if they knew anything about it. They all said no and promised me they would never do anything so cruel. One of them did tell me that the hotel was in fact haunted. This incident has left me wondering just what it was I saw that night. I think it might have been a demon looking for someone to possess.
So my sister called my family the other day and told my parents about a strange man that she and her friend came across. They have been there for about a week and were out walking in the redwoods when a man appeared out of practically nowhere and startled them. My sister claimed that he looked completely normal and was even kind of handsome, in her opinion, but he gave off a creepy vibe pretty quickly. He apparently began asking them weird questions like, who they were and what they were doing out in his woods. After they explained that they were just out exploring, he quickly got annoyed and said they were liars. My sister and her friend began to walk away quickly as they assumed he was probably on drugs but he walked after them and said more weird stuff. She says he even asked them to kiss each other because he knew they were lesbian lovers they are not lesbians by the way. My sister's friend apparently turned around and screamed at him to leave them alone. My sister said this is where he got scary as hell. She says he gave my sister and her friend the missed evil and hateful look she's ever seen in her life and he said this in response you two are such disrespectful bitches I've killed a few of you over the last few years and I'll love to add you both to my count. My sister and her friend didn't even hesitate and both booked it right after he said that. They heard him chasing after them and screaming at them. My sister says that she couldn't make out much of what he said other than that he would chop them up and a few other threats. They both made it safely out of the woods and they didn't see him anywhere. They got in Thier car and sped back to the town they were staying in. They called the police to file a report and headed to another area and will be heading home soon. I'm scared and pissed off that some creep did this to them. I served my country, Great Britain, for 12 years all over the globe. I've seen my fair share of face to face with some of the most evil people on earth. But nothing comes close to this. I was sent to Alberta, Canada to do some training back in 1993. On the first day, I and a friend decided to go for a walkabout to get to know the area. We bumped into a few Canadian soldiers. A few words were exchanged and one shouted back, don't let the monkeys keep you awake, they laughed. We just looked at each other and then carried on. While out on exercise a few of the guys said they were woken up in their sleeping bags by being pulled along the ground. I heard this a few times over the weeks. Also their kit rations and other bits going missing. Nothing came of it. Also an incident of one soldier missing, who was found the next day miles away from his platoon. He said he couldn't remember why he got separated but felt that he was followed during the night by some animal. Nothing more was said. We spent around 19 months out there. On one occasion, I was going out to check the lay of the land and a group of Canadian soldiers were just coming in. It looked like they had been out for a few days, looking at the state of them. One of them asked me, you going out? I replied. I don't know, he said. Monkeys. Watch your back. I replied, okay. I was thinking that I heard this before. I noticed the guys had their heads down. They looked pretty worn out. A few months on one of the guys said something about seeing three bears walking toward him on two feet on a trail while out walking. I immediately thought of walking on two feet. I went to find him. This was just a few hours after his encounter. I couldn't find him anywhere. The following day I asked around as to where he was. He's gone. A guy said. What do you mean gone? Gone back to his regiment? I knew straight away why. I later found the guy who told me about this. He just didn't want to talk about it so I left it there. It was September. I remember this well because I lost two of my best friends and I was feeling very down and lost. It was a bad time in my career for me. I decided to go for a drive, a weekend break. I had an old pickup truck and just drove, not really going anywhere in particular. I stopped for a break in a beautiful area not far from Medicine Lodge, Alberta. I had been on the road for two days, sleeping in the back of the pickup. I decided to go for a walk on a trail along a tree line. I walked about a hundred yards away from the tree line and I see a coyote just stop on the trail. I had never seen one so close. Our eyes met and we just stared at each other. I suddenly feel uncomfortable. The coyote keeps glancing back and forth from the tree line. 
I'm really feeling anxious, not because of the coyote but what's in the tree line. The coyote moves backward and forward, then just disappears into the grass. I'm left staring at the trees. Something is telling me to come closer. I can't explain this but my head's telling me no. I don't know how long I was there but I'm so scared. I've never felt so much fear. To the point where I felt sick. I slowly walk backward, keeping my eyes on the tree line. I then turned and ran like a bad dream. I got in my pickup and never looked back. I still think about it to this day. What was in those trees? The months go by and then my battalion comes over for an exercise. One night while out I was with another mate. We were parked on a hill overlooking a large bowl down below where a platoon of men were all sleeping. It was around 2.30 in the morning, clear skies. You could see a good distance without using any aids. My friend was asleep. I noticed a group of coyotes down below. It looks like they were looking for a free meal. I'm thinking is this what happens when someone feels they're being dragged in their sleeping bags? Could a coyote have that much strength? I watched them for a while getting bolder by the minute. Then suddenly their body language changed. Four of them ran in one direction while one was just standing there looking up the hill. I looked through my night vision. Then, all of a sudden, three human type figures just stood up one after the other, all of different sizes. The first thing that stood out to me on adjusting my sights is that I could clearly see that the largest one was a Bigfoot. No doubt about it. It was standing at 9 feet tall, and the second one was around 7 and a half feet tall. The other one was 6 feet in height. I looked at my mate still snoring away and just left him to it. The details on the tallest Bigfoot were easy to see. Wow, so big. I could see his eyes. They were all looking in my direction, then just turned and walked down into another valley. I could see the hair swaying on his arms, even the calf muscles. I'm just smiling to myself. To me, this was the last piece of the puzzle. I had recently told my daughter about this. She believes me. There are so many people that know about these creatures especially where I was. It's common knowledge. I think about them every day. I'm glad I saw them and I've always believed that they existed. Thorndale, Ontario is a place no one in here has likely heard of. It lies just north of London and is home to approximately one woodchuck, two beavers, and a few deer. Jokes aside, I lived in this town as a child, and grew up country, although London Arva was already not that far away and I did go to a high school in that area. Anyways, this little town has woods all around the northern side of it, opposite to London which, at that time, was a fair way south of Thorndale, but these days is not that far at all, maybe a couple miles max, and it was here where we would play as kids in the late 90s, very early 2000s, because rural internet that wasn't 16k dial-up internet certainly did not exist at that time. One day, while playing out in these woods, we heard a distant, but gut-wrenching scream so loud that it hurt our young ears. Somewhere, distantly, someone was in major distress. We only heard that scream before there was dead silence. We told our parents but, being kids, we lost interest in what had happened. Me and my friend's fathers went out, being big country men, and when they came back even us kids knew they'd seen something horrible. Years later my father told me that he found a woman with an axe buried so deep in her skull it came out the other side of her head. He did, naturally, call 911, but the person who committed the act was never found, so to this day Thorndale still likely has a murderer roaming its couple of streets. The reason I posted this here and not in Let's Not Meet or another more in Danger subreddit is because this was seemingly a homicide targeted at that woman specifically and it happened a mile or so into the woods, so far away from where we were. This incident occurred on April 29, 1982, in Newport News, Virginia. I was working the second shift as a field engineer at the shipyard and would get home between 11.30 and midnight. 
I would listen to the Richmond Rock Station at 102.1 MHz to relax and sometimes a challenge to receive, since it was 80 miles away. This night's reception was excellent and it was 1.30 am before I knew it. I told myself I would listen to one more song before going to bed. About a minute later, I heard some static that is characteristic of weak signal fading on FM. Okay, so I would go to bed now. I turned the stereo off and went down the hall to the master bedroom. Before I could turn on the room light, I noticed an orange glow, like a sodium vapor light, and some blue-green flashing lights out my back window. I had window shades on all windows since I needed a near dark to sleep during the day when I was on the third shift. I approached the window to open the shade and get a better look. My backyard adjoined a soybean field operated by the Baptist retirement home that was on the next street over. I knew they weren't out harvesting soybeans at 1.30 am. A voice in the back of my head warned me not to open the shade. I started to anyway but was warned again. The shades I bought had the edges curled in the two years since I had bought them, so I was able to see out a narrow slit. In the orange glow, I saw a figure about four feet high. It turned back towards the lights and disappeared out of my field of view. I tried to move the shade, but my fingers and arm wouldn't respond. The lights got much fainter and disappeared, all within a few seconds. Then, I was able to open the shade. I saw nothing. Suddenly I remembered the previous events of my life, Enfield, Connecticut 1966 and 1974. Again I asked them what was happening. I asked if it really was them. The answer I got was you will know soon. The following morning I immediately went to my backyard and looked for any indication of the previous evening's activity. I saw nothing. I was very disappointed, for at last I thought I had real evidence. A few days later, I looked out the window and saw three rings touching each other. They appeared to be perfect circles about 12 feet in diameter and from 4 to 6 inches in thickness and made of a gray-black powder. My next-door neighbor, a retired Air Force officer was gardening out back. I brought him a grass blade from the area. He immediately identified the material as a fungus common to the area due to the high humidity. He said the fungus typically starts as a small patch, then grows in random shapes outward sometimes forming rings up to two to three feet over several weeks. I showed him the three perfect 12-foot circles that appeared overnight. He had never seen anything like that. He then showed me several places where some of his azaleas were missing. The dirt was still fresh like they were pulled out by the roots. There was a footprint about five or six inches long near the plants. It looked like someone was wearing swimming fins with no obvious toe or heel marks. He thought some kids stole the flowers at night. He had several varieties of azaleas, and it appeared that at least one of each color was missing. I figured it would be little point in telling him what I saw a couple of days earlier, but I gave him a condensed version. I said, maybe aliens came from space, spread fungus spores in perfect rings in my backyard, then stole some of your azaleas, just for fun. A look of shock came over his face like I just revealed a state secret. He was not amused by my whimsical explanation. Instead, he asked me to tell him if I ever saw any little kids messing around his backyard. Sure, I said, I'll let you know. When I was in college I worked a couple of odd jobs to help pay the bills. They were mostly mundane but one shook me to my core. I was working for the city parks and lakes division at a local lake. It was a job that did involve some hard work, cleaning and repairing the boats and motors, but it also had more than enough downtime. Whenever there was no work to do my co-workers and I would sit around in the shade on the dock and talk. When I first started it was mostly the other guys telling me stories about the lake. Most of them were your run-of-the-mill fishermen stories, but there were a few with a much darker feel. It wasn't long before I started to have my own odd and nunners in the park. I split my time working there between the boat dock and working night security in the campgrounds. One night as I was driving the work truck around the lake into the campgrounds, part of my hourly patrol, 
I saw a pale blue light just above the road probably 100 feet in front of my truck. As I got close the light grew in intensity, then when I was about 30 feet away it took on a smoky appearance and dissipated in the night sky. That incident was definitely odd, but not at all in a scary sort of way. The next two incidents I had during the night shift, which led to me refusing the work the shift anymore, were definitely more disturbing and physical. Maybe a month after I saw the floating light I was driving down the hill from the campground back to the lake when I saw a man run out of the bushes. He was dirty, terrified, and wearing only his underwear. The first thought I had was that he was on drugs. The campground was cheap so we did get our fair share of homeless drug addicts. I quickly realized that wasn't the case, however. The second he saw my truck he came running towards me, clearly not looking to hurt me but rather for me to save him. When he was still a few yards away I was going to open my window to ask what was wrong when suddenly I saw a second person run out of the bushes. This time it was a woman. Her t-shirt was torn and dirty, her legs scratched from running through the bushes without pants on. I was confused to say the least, but the confusion quickly turned to anxiety when I saw she was carrying a large knife. Obviously this is what the man was running from. He didn't seem to notice her at first so I motioned to the passenger door, hoping he would get it so we could drive off and call the police before she got too close. As I was motioning to him was when he spotted her. He looked me in the eyes, and I could tell he knew he should run to the truck, but I watched as the panic overtook him, and he ran. The woman chased after, both heading across the road down into the brush towards the lake. I drove off to the park ranger station and called the police. I could hear the echoes of the man screaming and the woman's yelling. I talked to the police after they handled the situation. The man had been stabbed, but he would live. I went home, obviously shaken. Two months after that I was driving the truck through the campground and I saw what looked like a military style duffel bag hanging from a tree. The closer I got the more definition the shape took. By the time I was at the campsite I already had the police on the phone. I could hear the wife sleeping in the tent, but I decided I would let the police wake her and inform her that her husband had hanged himself. I never worked the night shift again. I thought if I worked strictly during the day on the boat dock all this would stop. I was wrong. I did work an entire summer without incident, but it was in the winter that it happened. It was a cold winter, by San Diego standards at least. Many times my shift would start before the sunrise, having to get the boats ready for all the fishermen coming in the early morning hours trying for trout. On one particular morning I got to work around 5 am. It was cold, in the mid-thirties, with frost still on the ground. I walked straight onto the dock and into the shed we used as a workshop. Most of the mornings the only employees at the park were me, a young woman who worked the concession stand, and a park ranger. Often the park ranger would come down to the dock about 20 minutes into my shift to make sure I had everything I needed. On this morning I was inside the workshop with the door closed, space heater on, and was working on a broken motor. I could tell when another person walked onto the dock because it would make the whole dock bob slightly in the water. I felt the dock rise and fall beneath my feet and kept at my work, assuming it was just the ranger. I could tell the footsteps went up to the door, paused for a second, then continued towards the end of the dock. After about five minutes without feeling the footsteps return I opened the door to see what the ranger was up to. I looked to the end of the dock and no one was there. I assumed I must have mistaken the slight waves of the water for footsteps, but noticed the water was smooth as glass, and that all the boats were tied up. I took a step out of the shop to get a better look and could hear the crunch of frost under my feet. When I looked down I noticed that there were two sets of footprints. One was mine, going from the shore straight to the shop. The second went past the shop, down the edge of the dock, and stopped. There were no prints going off the dock. I turned and saw the ranger walk towards the dock down the shore. I quit once he got within earshot. I was a 21 year old male, 240 pounds. Not a small or weak looking guy. 
I was wanting to lose some weight for a while now and had been going on walks for a bit, sometimes during the evening or very late at night. It was Florida and it gets hot unless it's night time, plus like I said I'm a big dude, I got nothing to worry about. Or so I thought. One fateful night I decide to go out walking around my neighborhood around 3am in like a big puffy jacket and black pants, feel like in this situation I would be the creepy person someone would be scared of. My walk was going good as usual and was actually getting close to the end of it. Then this like old school wood paneled passes by and goes into a driveway somewhat in front of me. I barely think anything of it, always three to six cars go by on one of these late night excursions. What happens next is what unsettled me. This van pulls back out of the driveway with its lights off after I pass by the driveway. Luckily I wasn't listening to any music or else I wouldn't have heard it. The van then proceeds to pull out and drive towards me and stops right in front of me. At this point I know I don't want to end up like some kind of horror movie character, so I book it in the opposite direction. I go down an off-branching street, and keep going down these random streets to give me as much time as possible. I end up hiding in some random ass bushes in someone's yard and stay there for a little bit. I wanted to text my mom but I was scared and didn't want the light from my phone to give me away. So I watch for any sign of them. Nothing for 5 minutes. Just as you think the coast is clear, boom, I hear a car coming down the street and it's those men but with their lights on this time. I'm pretty hidden in these bushes right against someone's house so they just go by, but my heart is beating so fast and I'm terrified in this moment. I wait a little bit more till I truly believe the coast is clear and get back to my house. I wake up my mom and we call the cops and I give them as much info as possible. They said they would patrol the neighborhood and I don't hear anything more. I just can't help thinking about that event, and what their motives were. I always try to debunk shit like that, but all their actions pointed to wanting to do something to me. But what did they want to do? I'm not a pretty young lady, I'm a very large, menacing dude. My neighborhood is not even nice enough to rob, very just middle class, and what the f am I going to have on me while walking at 2 am. So I just can't help but think maybe they didn't want to kidnap me or mug me but kill me. It freaks me out to this day. I experienced a handful of peculiar occurrences, but they ceased until I met my wife. In our first apartment, an unseen presence would tap on the soles of my feet as I slept. Every other day for two months, after returning home from work, the microwave clock would read 514, while the one on my nightstand read 714, despite all other clocks displaying the correct time. In our kitchen hung a wine bottle holder. My wife always positioned the labels outward, but occasionally, all bottles except the top one and bottom one would inexplicably have their labels facing inward. The bullet casings from my grandfather's funeral flag, lined up on the bookshelf, would occasionally rearrange themselves. When our lease expired, we moved to another apartment where the only oddity was the persistent foot tapping as I tried to sleep. The year following, we built our own house. In the two years we've lived here, a variety of oddities has persisted. I've noticed shadows without sources, and the foot tapping continues. Our cat and dog often seem to follow something invisible around the room with their gaze. A small pig statue on a dining room shelf rotates on its own. Footsteps echo on the wooden laminate floor we installed in the living room, day and night. The wine bottles also persist in their rotation, as in our first apartment. My wife finds these events somewhat unnerving but we mostly view them as a source of entertainment. We've made a game of spotting what's changed each time we walk into the house. Our resident ghost, which we've affectionately named Bud, hasn't ever displayed any violent or threatening behavior. In fact, we've taken to talking to Bud. However, the day we returned home to find all four stove burners switched on, twice in a row, did unsettle us. After the second incident, I addressed Bud directly, requesting that he not leave the stove on and risk burning the house down. Since then, it hasn't happened again. Through all these occurrences, 
I can't help but believe in the presence of something beyond our understanding. I often wonder what prompted this entity to make itself known and why Bud has chosen to follow us. Despite the peculiarities, it's been mostly harmless, and, in a strange way, Bud has become a part of our family. To be honest, I'm starting to freak out a little. Of all the spirits I could think of that might have attached to me, none felt quite right. But there was one, a playful, gentle spirit, who I hadn't considered till now. It's dawning on me that our bud might actually be a young girl I once knew during my time overseas. Her name was Ally, the 11-year-old daughter of our translator, Alex. She had taken a shine to me, constantly referring to me as cowboy because I hailed from Texas. She'd speak of her dreams to become a cowgirl, of riding horses and wearing cowboy boots, all in Texas. On every patrol we conducted in her village, Ally would rush to greet us, always with a jubilant, cowboy. Cowboy. Go Texas. I made a point of bringing treats or small gifts for her. There was a sense of joy in our interactions, a kind of innocence that was so rare in those conditions. One heartbreaking day, we rolled into Alex's village to pick him up for a mission. Instead, we found Alex packing his family into their car, preparing to visit relatives. I wished them a safe journey and promised Ally a soccer ball upon my return. I remember her giggling as she clutched the bag of Twizzlers I'd brought for her that day. A few miles down the road, we came upon the wreckage of their car. An IED, intended for our patrol, had taken them instead. In my despair, I had thrown caution to the wind, rushing towards the mangled car. I found Ally's foot, still in her sandal, among the wreckage. I remember collapsing, cradling her foot in my hands, overcome by guilt and sorrow. I don't know how long I knelt there, or when I began firing at two men behind a small berm. All I know is that when it was over, they had to scoop up the remnants of that tragic scene with a snow shovel. As a final tribute to Ally, I placed my US flag in what remained of her small hand, my heart heavy with a grief that has never really left me. Now, I think I understand. The casings, the flag, the pig statue, her favorite animal, the boots, and the tapping on my foot, like her playful nudges. It all fits. But is ally. In her own way, she finally got her wish. She's in Texas, maybe even wearing her cowboy boots. The realization is bittersweet and profound. Oh my god, it's ally. At our lease we are fortunate enough to have an old house that we have cleaned up and live in. It is extremely old and was owned by the rancher that used to own the property. When we originally started cleaning it out it had been vacant for years, animals had gotten inside and tore the place up. Holes in the walls, floors etc. We boarded up the walls, and other holes, closed and permanently locked old closets. My dad and I sleep in one room an uncle in an adjacent room, and my other uncle in a trailer outside. About 11 p.m. on 11 5 11 my bed starts moving back and forth, with me in it. I thought it was my dad shaking my bed, playing a joke on me because that's just his nature. I said, Dad stop. It was obvious he wasn't doing anything and was asleep. My bed literally rocked back and forth with me in it for almost a minute and all I could think about was the scene in Paranormal Activity where the demon grabs and pulls the woman out of the bed. I knew that was about to happen to me any second. Then lights started shining in our window and I heard doors open and shut, pans clinking together in the kitchen, and thought, I'm about to die. Eventually it all stopped and I went to bed. The next morning after the hunt we all were talking and I asked everyone if they heard or felt anything last night. Everyone did, which freaked me out. Well it turns out that was the night of the first earthquake in Oklahoma, and we hunt in the panhandle of Texas. That's why the bed was shaking and the pans rattling. The doors opening and light shining was my uncle getting out of his trailer because he thought we were playing a joke on him and rocking his trailer back and forth. We all had a good laugh when we realized what had actually happened.
Okay it all started out when my brother and his friends went down the hill playing in an old stage coach house. Shortly after that funny things started happening, like stuff being moved around my mom's little trinkets especially being moved around. For example an old perfume bottle with an air squirt pocket deal with tassels on it. Then one evening my brother was doing his homework in the living room and the hutch doors with wood latches like on a deer blind window moved on their own and the doors opened and then slammed back. Then he heard what sounded like running up the stairs. He freaked out and told my mom he was not staying in that house. He was basically crying he was so scared she told him to calm down. It was nothing but she was scared herself. Two nights later my brother which was 14 at the time woke up and there was a young girl bellied up to his bed. Watching him sleep. He tucked his head under the covers and stayed awake till the sun came up. A night or two went by and he was in his room, he heard his clothes hangers clanking around in his closet. He ran downstairs told my mom what happened. They both stood at the bottom of the stairs and yelled. Can you please leave Cooper alone? You are scaring him. He can't even stay in his own room you need to leave. At that moment his door slammed shut which really freaked my mom out. My brother said screw this. He stormed up there and said I'm not scared. Look. I'm getting my shoot gun out and I will blow your head up if you come out again. His gun was in his gun cabinet in his room which had a key lock and left the gun by his bed. For a few weeks nothing happened so he went to pull his gun cabinet keys out to put his gun away. And they were not in his nightstand or anywhere else. So months go by and it's just little things that are happening. One day my mom was cleaning my brother's closet out and underneath a bunch of crap was a suitcase that hadn't been used. In about a year she picked it up and heard something. She opened it and it was his keys to the cabinet. We are guessing it put it in there after getting scared. A few nights later she showed up again in the corner of my brother's room. He freaked out ran downstairs. Woke my mom up and she remembers it being 3.12 am. He slept with her the rest of the night. I come home from college a few weeks later knowing about none of this. Few mornings go by and my mom always asks how did you sleep last night. Every miming it was always grey. It feels good to sleep in my old bed but it's so weird I keep waking up at 3.12 am every single night. Still she says nothing about the stuff that has happened. Walking around the house alone I felt weird and taking a shower I felt like someone was watching me. I had never felt that before. Well one night I was at the house by myself and heard what sounded like someone jumping on the bed upstairs. I yelled hey and the door slammed. I got my keys and hauled down the road to my friend's mom's house. I'm getting goosebumps just telling this story. Well I confront my mom and she spills the beans about what is going on. A few nights later I come home from partying with my friends and there is anime come from the oven. And a cast iron pot was on fire. The funny thing about it was that oven was only used to store pots and pans the oven didn't work. It was an older antique oven. My mom woke yelling what are you doing and she realizes it would be impossible for me to light that oven. I was freaked out bad. Really didn't want to stay there anymore but I did. Well my mom got a hold of a paranormal person in Virginia and told him the stories. Told him where we lived. He did some research and got back with us and faxed a pic of a little girl that was 11 that died of smallpox in the stagecoach house. And before showing my brother have him describe her. Well he described her to a T. The paranormal guy said that when my brother and his grind went down to the house they might have woke her spirit and since they were around the same age she just wanted to play and followed my brother back to the house. And she would not hurt him she wanted to play jokes and stuff. After that my brother wasn't as scared. He would just tell her to leave him alone but would leave little trinkets out for her to play with. And they would always get moved around but nothing else dramatic happened with the little girl. I left quite a bit out, but if I typed all of it my fingers would fall off. The house burning down is another story. Hope y'all enjoyed. I remember a chilling story that was shared with me by my uncle and my dad. It happened during one of their jobs near a dense wooded area. 
It all began when my uncle mysteriously vanished, leaving my dad bewildered. Concerned for his brother's safety, my dad started searching the woods, desperately trying to locate him. And then, amidst the eerie silence of the forest, my dad stumbled upon my uncle frantically running around. Naturally, my dad was taken aback and demanded an explanation. What the hell are you doing? He exclaimed. But my uncle, his face etched with a mixture of fear and confusion, responded with something that sent shivers down my spine. I swear to God, I heard someone calling my name out here, and I was trying to find out where it was coming from. That story has always haunted me. It's unsettling to think that such experiences are not uncommon. The idea of hearing phantom voices in the woods, calling out to unsuspecting souls, continues to send a chill down my spine. It's as if the forests hold secrets, whispering their mysteries into the ears of those who dare to listen. I have a story to share with you that left me quite intrigued. It involves my neighbor and a rather unexpected visitor. It was on January 6th or 7th of this year when this incident took place, and it's something that still gives me chills when I think about it. My neighbor, an elderly woman who lives about three miles away from me near Highway 101, had a startling encounter. She recounted that Bigfoot, yes, you heard that right, Bigfoot, paid her a visit on her back porch. Now, we do have quite a few bears in the area, and at first, she assumed it was one of them causing the commotion. But when she went to investigate the noise, she realized it was something far more astonishing. Standing just five feet away, she caught sight of a silhouette unlike anything she had ever seen before. It wasn't a bear, she was certain of that. This figure, towering at five feet seven in height compared to her husband, had distinct features that set it apart. She was particularly struck by its large and thick neck, a feature she hadn't associated with Bigfoot before. It was an unexpected detail that caught her attention. As she observed the creature rummaging through her garbage can, she couldn't help but feel a mix of awe and curiosity. Bigfoot, right there on her porch. The encounter was both exhilarating and unsettling for her. She mentioned that she and her husband have no dogs, so there were no other distractions or explanations for what she saw. I had heard tales and legends of Bigfoot before, but this first-hand account from someone I know left me amazed. The fact that Bigfoot would venture so close to human habitation, even in our quiet neighborhood, made it all the more captivating. It made me wonder how many other extraordinary encounters might have happened in our vicinity without our knowledge. Steve, another neighbor who relayed this story to me, mentioned that sightings of Bigfoot in our area weren't unheard of. However, this particular visit to my neighbor's porch added a new layer of intrigue and speculation to the ongoing mysteries surrounding this elusive creature. As for me, I find myself walking around with a newfound sense of wonder and excitement. Who knows what other extraordinary creatures or phenomena might be lurking just beyond our backyards. It's a reminder that there are still mysteries in the world waiting to be unraveled, and I can't help but be captivated by the possibilities. I have a fascinating story to share with you, one that happened to a man named John. It was a memorable evening when he and his wife decided to spend some time at Rooster Rock State Park in Oregon, right by the majestic Columbia River. Little did they know that their peaceful fishing trip would take an unexpected turn. It was around 2 a.m., and John found himself alone at the fishing inlet while his wife peacefully slept in their tent. The full moon illuminated the surroundings, creating an eerie yet beautiful atmosphere. As he cast his line, he heard a piercing and mournful scream that seemed to come from a distance. The sound sent shivers down his spine, filling the air with an unsettling presence. Curiosity got the better of John, and he turned his gaze in the direction of the scream. To his astonishment, just ten feet away, stood a massive figure that could only be described as a ten-foot-tall Bigfoot. The creature didn't seem to pay any attention to John, its gaze fixed across the river. Rooster Rock, being known as a potential crossing point for Bigfoot, 
added a layer of credibility to this extraordinary encounter. As John stood frozen, he couldn't help but notice the creature's eyes. In the moonlight, they shimmered like silver dollars, eight inches apart, glowing with an intense fiery red. It was a sight that sent chills down his spine, filling him with a mix of fear and awe. Panic started to take hold of him, but then something inexplicable happened. A message of peace and non-aggression echoed in John's mind, as if telepathically communicated. It was a calming presence, urging him to maintain a sense of peace and to back away slowly. He listened to the message, turned around, collected his fishing gear, and started to retreat. The encounter had left him in a state of shock and disbelief. In a daze, John packed up his belongings and left in his boat, leaving his wife behind in the tent, completely unaware of what had just transpired. Later, when she woke up and discovered her husband missing, she sought help from a friend to search for him. Little did she know that John had been arrested, a consequence of the encounter's aftermath. As unbelievable as it may sound, the couple returned to the site later, driven by a need for answers. Their disbelief turned into astonishment when they discovered deep and wide tracks, measuring 17 and 20 inches in length. It was evidence that something extraordinary had indeed occurred that night. John, now eager to share his story, expressed his intention to return and recount his experiences when he finds the time. However, he chose not to disclose his last name or any contact information for verification purposes, leaving his tale to be shared solely through word of mouth. This encounter with the enigmatic Bigfoot left John and his wife forever changed, their perspective on the world forever expanded. It serves as a reminder that there are still mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting to be explored and understood. Reports of a large bipedal canine resembling a hyena have been circulating around Grand Rapids in the lower peninsula of Michigan. Officer Blackburn had his incident on February 2, 1999, and I was the one who responded to the call. We received reports of an unidentified animal spotted on King Highway near Riesland Drive and Comstock Park. Since our jurisdiction covered the entire county, we quickly made our way to the scene. According to the witnesses, they were driving when they suddenly caught sight of something darting across the road and disappearing into the nearby woods. Their description sent chills down my spine, a creature standing about six feet tall, covered in black fur, with a long and swiftly moving tail. Its movements were eerily fluid, reminiscent of a kangaroo. They expected it to leap over a nearby ditch, but it never did. The most unsettling detail was that it ran on two legs. Without wasting any time, I ventured into the wooded area, following the tracks I found in the snow. Step by step, I pressed forward, keen on uncovering the truth. The tracks led me deeper into the woods, and for about 15 minutes, I diligently pursued their trail. However, my efforts came to an abrupt halt when the tracks vanished at a steep embankment. The feat of scaling that bank with feet like those I had seen was impossible, with massive canine feet measuring around 20 inches in length. It was perplexing and added another layer of mystery to the situation. Interestingly, the reports of this creature have only emerged during daylight hours, with no known sightings of the creature at night. This deviation from typical Bigfoot encounters, which mostly occur under cover of darkness, makes it all the more unusual. The witnesses, exclusively rural residents, have shared their experiences of hearing strange sounds before coming face to face with this large bipedal canine figure while engaging in activities such as hunting or hiking. Reflecting on these accounts, I can't help but wonder about the existence of such a creature. It raises questions that linger in my mind. What could be the nature of this mysterious being? And what secrets do the woods hold within their depths? About seven years ago, I had a remarkable encounter with two Sasquatch in the Blue Mountains of Walla Walla, Washington. It was shortly after I had relocated from Houston, Texas, and I decided to take my dad's bug for a drive. I ventured up Mill Creek Road, 
which led me to Squaw Springs campgrounds. It was quite a journey, about an hour and a half into the blues, on a somewhat gravel road. If I recall correctly, it was either July or August. As dusk settled in, I turned on my headlights while navigating a bend in the road. That's when I spotted them crossing the road, two impressive creatures. One stood approximately eight feet tall, while the other was around seven feet. They locked eyes with me, and the reflection of my headlights revealed their eyes to be a striking yellow color. The sun's gentle glow highlighted their bodies, making it evident that these were not bears or elk. I brought my vehicle to a halt as they crossed, hoping to catch another glimpse as they disappeared into the woods. Unfortunately, I couldn't see anything further, nor did I detect any peculiar odors. I searched for tracks, but the ground was too hard to find any conclusive evidence. So, I returned to my bug and headed home. A week or two later, while shopping at the Eastgate Mall, I stumbled upon a Bigfoot display arranged by two individuals named Paul Freeman and Wes Summerlin. They had set up an exhibit featuring two stuffed Bigfoots. Intrigued, I shared with them my encounter in the blues. They informed me that the creatures I had seen were a male and female couple that had been spotted numerous times. Freeman, in particular, had made notable discoveries, uncovering miles of tracks and capturing video footage of Bigfoot in the area. However, over time, it became evident that Freeman had fabricated a significant portion of his evidence, which was disappointing because I believed he possessed genuine material. Nonetheless, I formed a friendship with the Summerlin family and even accompanied them on a search for Bigfoot. Wes, in particular, had a wealth of stories, hair samples, photographs, and more. He never sought to sensationalize the matter, he simply believed, and that was enough. Unfortunately, Wes passed away some time ago, and I don't believe any substantial research is ongoing in the area. However, a friend and I still venture into the mountains a couple of times a week, continuing our quest. I know Sasquatch is here, I've seen them with my own eyes. The number of sightings may have decreased since Freeman's departure, leading some to doubt their existence. It's an ironic situation because deep down, you know Bigfoot is real, yet the evidence you stumble upon sometimes points in the opposite direction, despite your first-hand encounters. Back in 2021 my family took a trip to Lake St. Itla in North Carolina. A beautiful lake that's rich in Native American history and surrounded by mountain trails. We decided to go on one of these trails on an overcast day. I am not an athletic person and suffer from asthma so I was behind the rest of my family by myself. About almost halfway through the hike I heard my sister yell my birth name but it sounded like it was off the trail. She never calls me by real name just my nickname I've had since I was a baby. It sounded like she was scared so I was very tempted to run off and find her but I knew my sister wasn't stupid. She wouldn't go off the trail even in case of an emergency. I quickly caught up to the rest of my family and my sister was there with them. Resting on some rocks next to a waterfall. Chatting away and taking pictures. I asked my sister if she had called my name. She didn't know what I was talking about. She had been talking to our dad the whole time. I don't know what called my name that day but I'm glad I didn't listen to it. Who knows what would have happened to me. I haven't been to that trail since this encounter. I don't have a clue what called my name. If you're educated on Appalachian folklore please give me some insight on what happened to me. I'm back with another story I'd like to share with you. Or rather, I feel the need to share with you as there's nothing I like about it when someone goes missing in our national parks. The British search and rescue team are contacted immediately, however, they are always at least half an hour's flight away. And even then, they only have so much flight time before they are forced to turn their helicopter around to refuel. This leaves a lot of searching down to the rangers, as we know all of the areas and trails very well. It's always an adrenaline pump situation to be in, as you never know what the outcome will be. Usually, 
The helicopter spots the lost people within 20 minutes of joining the search. But then there are the missing people. You should know that between the rangers, we refer to these situations with two categories, lost people and missing people. A lost person is a normal search and rescue scenario. Somebody went down the wrong trail and hasn't been seen in a while, and perhaps throwing a broken leg for good measure. The main thing is that we find them, even if they are a little beaten up. A missing person is somebody who hasn't been seen for anything over a day, or if the situation just seems off. For example, when people just seem to disappear. I have one particular case I'm going to share with you. I will warn you closer to the time, but there is some pretty explicit content in this memory, so here is your far pre-warning. It was a pretty standard shift. The sky was just starting to dim as the sun started sinking towards the horizon, and I was sat in the ranger station taking calls and checking emails. When a woman comes bursting to the door, absolutely beside herself. Her hair is a mess with leaves tangled in it, her makeup is all smudged down and across her face, and her eyes are red from crying. She's telling me that her son had been by her side one minute, and when he went to the bushes just off the trail for a wee, he never came back. There was no scream, no noise, no nothing. I knew at this instant we had a missing person on our hands, and my heart stopped. A missing child was always bad news and seldom had a happy ending. He had been in the bush for maybe two minutes when his mother called out to him, and she went running into the woods to try and find him. She was very lucky to have made it back to the trail without getting lost or worse, if you ask me. I tried my best to calm her down and took her to a map, and after showing her where our station was, I asked her to try and locate their average location at the time while I made some calls. She protested at first, but after assuring her we had dealt with this kind of situation many times before, she brought herself to trust my instructions and started tracing her tracks on the map. I immediately called the search and rescue team closest to us and told them the exact location was to be confirmed, but to dispatch a helicopter for a missing child. They gave us an ETA of 40 minutes. I gather all the rangers on duty and, after confirming with the woman where she believed they were when he disappeared, we all get assigned grids on the map to check and we head out. We are very thorough as we search, and we each square off the grid very effectively, and do not leave so much as a rock unturned. So we're getting deeper and deeper into the woods. At this point, we've been searching for a good couple of hours, but the dogs hadn't picked up the boys sent yet, and we were merely doing a routine comb-styled search. The helicopter was buzzing around non-stop, and everybody was quiet. No one really spoke much while looking for children. I think it's because of the fact that it's a child we are looking for, not an adult who may be able to look after themselves. I'm getting this heavy knotted feeling in my gut, you know, the kind you get when you just know that it's going to be a fruitless effort. I should also mention that it's getting dark now, and there's not much light left, and what little is left is completely blocked out by the trees, so it's flashlights from here on out. We'll never find this kid, bro, my colleague said in a completely flat voice. Don't talk like that. We never know what we can find while searching, I reply sharply, though deep down in my gut, I knew that child was gone. The helicopter heads back for some more fuel and comes back again after a further few hours of searching. It is getting very dark and we call it a night as everyone needs to be back before the forest is completely consumed by darkness. The woman stayed in one of the medical beds we had previously prepared for her son, though I doubt she slept at all. I watched the cameras that lay deep in the forest, somewhat in the area the child could have walked in. After an hour or so of nothing, I eventually decided to call it a night. We didn't find this boy the next day or the day after that, for that matter. Three weeks later, one of our rangers radios that they found the body of the child deep into the woods. So sad. It was the summer of 2019, and I found myself near Snow Lake in Washington State. As dusk settled in, I realized I was one of the few remaining visitors at the lake. The tranquility of the surroundings was interrupted when I heard my Japanese middle name being called out, 
a name that is quite uncommon even among Japanese individuals. It stopped me dead in my tracks. The voice seemed to originate from the opposite direction of where I had come from. Initially, I thought it was merely a coincidence, someone sharing the same name as me. But as the voice called out again, and then once more, doubt turned into unease. My instincts kicked in, telling me that something was not right. I grabbed my friend and urged them to accompany me back to the parking lot before darkness consumed the landscape. With only our phone lights to guide us, we embarked on the final two miles of the hike in pitch black darkness. The whole experience was unsettling, and I vowed to only visit the area during daylight hours from that point on. Snow Lake had been a beautiful location, but the strange encounter left me wary. Over a year later, I learned of a chilling incident that occurred in the same area. A man named Brendan Neppen had gone missing along with his dog. He was a 37-year-old avid hiker, and despite extensive search efforts, not a single trace of him or his dog was ever found. There were speculations that he may have hiked further up the trail to Gem Lake, which was just under two miles away from Snow Lake. I had been to Gem Lake myself during the day, appreciating its breathtaking views. It's an open area, seemingly impossible to get lost in. The disappearance of Brendan Neppen struck a chord with me, as I recalled my own eerie encounter near Snow Lake. It served as a grim reminder that even in the most stunning landscapes, there may be an underlying darkness, hidden from view. The memory of that voice calling my name still lingers, a chilling reminder of the mysteries that lie within the wilderness. Let me share a story from the mid-80s that still gives me goosebumps to this day. It was during that time when my friend, our girlfriends, and I embarked on a road trip from Baltimore to Hampton Roads for a couple of Grateful Dead concerts. The concerts were a blast, and we were filled with euphoria as we made our way back home after the second show, which I believe took place on a Saturday or Sunday. Somewhere north of Richmond, in the desolate stretches of I-95, we decided to pull over and take a break. We found a secluded spot, far enough off the road, to relieve ourselves. The girls opted to go by the side of the car, while my friend and I ventured closer to the tree line. It was the middle of the night, and the surrounding area was shrouded in darkness. As we finished up, the stillness of the night was broken by a sudden and quiet whistle. It was that classic wheat woo sound, originating from the other side of the tree line. The moment the whistle reached our ears, a chill ran down our spines. We exchanged a glance of disbelief and fear, hastily zipped up, and sprinted back towards the car. Our girlfriends were taken aback by our sudden urgency as we jumped into the car and sped away. They demanded an explanation, wondering what had happened. We decided to wait until we were a safe distance down the road before sharing the unsettling encounter with them. It was at that moment that we recounted the whistle from the other side of the trees, relaying our sense of alarm and the urgency to leave the area. The girls were equally shocked and disturbed by our experience. To this day, the memory of that night haunts us. We often speculate about who or what could have made that whistle in the darkness of the Virginia wilderness. Was it a harmless passerby, or did it carry a more sinister intent? The unanswered questions and the feeling of unease have stayed with us ever since that night on the side of I-95. My name is Officer Jake Thompson, and I've carried a haunting memory with me since my childhood, an encounter with an unidentified creature that forever etched fear into my heart. That memory has fueled my obsession, my unrelenting pursuit to solve the mystery of its existence. Years passed, and I became a seasoned cop, but the memory of that encounter never left me. And then, one fateful night, a series of bizarre animal attacks gripped the city. The details struck me with an eerie familiarity, bearing a striking resemblance to the horrors of my childhood. Deep down, I knew that the creature had returned. Convinced of its reappearance, I assembled a team of fellow officers who had also experienced encounters with the unknown. We shared a bond, forged by the terror that lurked in the shadows. 
Each member carried their own scars, haunted by their personal encounters with the enigmatic creature. Together, we vowed to face it head on and put an end to its reign of terror. As we embarked on our hunt, tensions simmered beneath the surface. The weight of our shared traumas tested our bonds, stretching them to their limits. Yet, we pressed forward, fueled by a collective determination to uncover the truth and protect those we swore to serve. Night after night, we tracked the creature across the city, following the trail of bizarre animal attacks. With every step, the air grew heavy with anticipation and fear. The line between predator and prey blurred, as we became both hunters and the hunted. Finally, we cornered the creature in an abandoned warehouse. A palpable tension hung in the air, each member of our team ready to face the ultimate test. But as the climactic showdown unfolded, the true strength of the creature revealed itself. With terrifying speed and brute force, it overpowered us, striking us down one by one. The very officers who had once stood by my side, now fell victim to the creature's relentless assault. Blood stained the cold concrete floor as the echoes of our desperate struggle reverberated through the empty space. I fought valiantly, refusing to succumb to the creature's savagery. But in the end, I too became its prey. As my strength waned, I stared into the eyes of the creature, witnessing the culmination of a lifelong obsession. It had defeated me, the last one standing. In my final moments, as darkness claimed me, I realized the true nature of my pursuit. It had consumed me, blinded me to the inevitable cost. My obsession had led to the demise of not only myself but also those I had come to consider family. As Officer Jake Thompson fell, another victim of the creature he had sought to defeat, the city remained shrouded in the terror of the unknown. The memory of our sacrifice would fade, but the creature would linger, a constant reminder of the darkness that exists just beyond the edges of our perception. And so, my story ends in tragedy, a cautionary tale of how obsession and the pursuit of the unknown can devour even the strongest among us. The unanswered questions and the lurking fears would continue to haunt the city, a reminder that sometimes, there are mysteries that should remain unsolved. I've spent tons of my life in the forests, and scrublands, of Washington, including some very minimalistic backcountry long-distance hikes, and these are the only truly unnerving things that happened. The first was maybe 2010. Hiking on the Colonel Bob Trail, and it was fairly empty because it was a rainy day and the trail was partially washed out at the time. We only saw one other person the whole time, a man we first passed resting against a rock, carrying a rifle. My friend started chatting to him and asked if he was hunting, and he said no, he was actually out training for an upcoming hunting event. After this we passed him repeatedly without ever seeing him pass us, and without him saying a word to us. Often he was just crouched in the bushes off the trail, watching us go by. I get that he was just a very skilled stalker who could move quietly off the trail beside us, but even though I know this was just his hobby that had nothing to do with us, it sort of felt like we were the targets of the stalking and made me uneasy. The second, I think it was 2019, was weirder. We'd been camping for a few nights, just sleeping in the van in spots around the National Forest, having a great time. Moonlight, full sky of stars, owls and insects, the whole experience. We hadn't seen any other people in the forest itself, but it was very lively and safe feeling. On the third night we were fairly deep in somewhere southeast of Quinault, and the atmosphere was completely different. There were a ton of fires going in Washington and Oregon so the air had gotten really thick with smoke, then fog had rolled in off the Pacific, and the two together completely absorbed all noise and light. There was no wind at all, no rustling of trees, and not a glimmer of light. With the headlights of the van visibility was maybe two feet, but with them off it was space mountain levels of darkness. Like you could not see your own hand an inch from your face. I opened the van door to get out and piss before sleeping but decided against it. The air was seriously just so thick, still, and dark that it made all my hair stand on end. 
Plus we'd parked on a road with steep switchbacks so I was a little bit worried I'd walk off a cliff. Since neither of us were risking going outside we went straight to bed. As we were drifting off there was suddenly pounding on the middle side window, right above where I was lying, and on the side facing the trees rather than the road. It sounded like an angry person banging on it with the side of their fist. We both went dead silent and still, then my friend roared, what? In a comically deep voice. No answer, but maybe 10 seconds later we heard a slow tap. Tap. Scrape on the side of the van. My friend had lived in this van in Seattle for 5 years and it had plenty of people actually trying to break in and basically just shoot them away, but in that moment he said F this and we got into our seats, got our seat belts on, and left. Like maybe there was someone camped nearby, but they definitely weren't behind us, or to the right or left of us. And the worst part is that it was a gravel forestry access road, with gravel on both sides of the car, on the most oppressively silent night I've ever experienced, and we didn't hear a single footstep. I think the absence of footsteps is actually what gave both of us the sense of urgency, because it did not feel like this was a drunk grouse hunter trying to pull a prank. We were in Skykomish overnight in July 2007 for an event, and there also happened to be some kind of town reunion so the hotel was full. My youngest was almost one and woke up crying and simply would not stop, which was unusual for her. I grew concerned that she would wake up people in the rooms nearby so went out to the car to drive around a bit, thinking that might soothe her to sleep. Skykomish is a tiny mountain town on Highway 2, along the Skykomish River, and the railroad does stop there for freight. It consists of a four-block square of streets, and a bridge crosses over the river to Highway 2, which I would not cross since I didn't want to be on the highway at night. Around and around, slowly and with the window down as it was warm, I drove the square, while my baby was quiet, but she would immediately cry if I went back to park at the hotel. Back we went, and the entire time I could hear the frantic cries of birds yet could never see them. This twittering never stopped, and it didn't sound like bats, yet I still don't know what birds were crying in the dark like that. The strangest part was that I could drive alongside the rail yard, in full view of the trains, tracks, and buildings, where I could hear clanging and men talking, which seemed comforting except that I never spotted a single person. There were lights, and train engines were running, yet all this bustling activity never revealed the sight of a single person. The worst part for me was that my baby never did go back to sleep until after daybreak, so I was out the entire night among all the unknown noises. As I said, I don't think it was supernatural, but I wish I knew what the sounds were. I thought of it a couple years ago when a young woman named Gia Fuda disappeared there and was feared dead, yet was found eight nine days later alive, sitting naked next to the river with no memory of where she'd been. I will never stay overnight there again. I'm from Oslo city in Norway, but when I was a teenager, we moved to a bit more remote place about 30 minutes outside the city. Mostly houses and woods, and moose, badger, fox, wolf and lynx around but mostly lots of roe deers, whose way used to humans. No farms and stables in the nearby area. No homeless people and the teens who snuck out usually hung around the mall to steal fresh delivered Napoleon cake from the bakery's loading dock. We lived quite central by a mall, school and such. There was a small forest behind our house, maybe five kilometer radius. One summer, two friends and I went camping for one night in the small forest. We were 14-15 years old girls. There was a bonfire place about 100 meter from my house, where we put up the tent. The ground is packed tight and has this hollow sound when you walk on it. The tent was big for three and kind of round. So it would be hard for someone to reach the top without collapsing on the tent wall. And it was an old tent and the fabric was quite rotten. It did not rain that night. We did not bring any food or food equipment, except candy that we had inside the tent. What happened, we sat up gossiping and eating candy until midnight. 
When we tried to sleep, we heard hooves walking beside the tent. We laid still listening, pretty sure there were curious roe deers. But it was also this rattling sound of metal that seemed weird. Not like tin cans, but just like night armor sound from movies. Suddenly it started to blow up with strong wind and we started talking to ease the atmosphere. The hooves and metal sound reminded me of a knight on a horse. Then my one friend said that sounds like two knights. We brushed it off as roe deers, but we never heard them leave. We kept talking when suddenly the wind ripped open a huge gash in the middle of the tent roof, right above me, and strong light, can only describe it as a lightning, came through the opening. We screamed and the wind stopped and the light disappeared as quickly as it came. We didn't hear anything around us, it was dead silence. No sound of footsteps or hooves, no sound of helicopter or anything. We just looked at each other and panicked out of the tent and run to my place for the rest of the night. Went back next morning and took down the tent and looked around. Found nothing that could help us figure out what happened. We did not drink or take drugs that night. My parents slept, so it couldn't be them messing with us. I've been much around in this little forest in my teens. Never experienced weird things before or after. In the aftermath, we nervously landed on some kind of rare lightning and rode deers with one foot in a metal can. But we didn't believe that either. One year ago this weekend I took a solo backpacking trip to the Otter Creek Wilderness in West Virginia. Plan was for 16 mile loop over one night. Due to impassable river I put camp up about a mile in. Beautiful spot with campsites along river, wonderful weather. I hung out, hiked around and enjoyed the solitude. I had not and did not see another person since entering the forest roads. Mid-afternoon I decide to lay down in the tent and just relax slash nap. I'm awoken after about 45 minutes. By the sound of a metallic clattering. Closest description, take a round fire pit or large grill grate and drop it on its side. And it's close. Of course I assume other people. Nothing. No sign of anyone anywhere and nothing in the area that could have accounted for that sound. Curious and confused, I go about my day. Later, explored more, dinner, fire and enjoying the forest night. Around 9.30 I heard a distinct single knock come from the hillside above me. As I turned to shine flashlight in that direction and saw nothing, another single knock came from over my left shoulder, closer to the river. I don't think it was a cross river as it was pretty clear. Suddenly feeling not alone, I packed up and headed out. Slept in my truck with no other issues. I'm well aware of knocking reports. Anyone have anything similar to the metallic sound experience? I used to night hike with friends during high school and go off into wilderness around North Bend, Fall City, and Preston. Sometimes in the rain at 2 a.m. I did one time have an encounter with something deer looking and tall us in the middle of the night at the top of the Issaquah Highlands, also ran into my first bear encounter there lol. Whatever it was it was peering out of the bushes near the only street light on a road that goes into the wealthiest homes there. I was just taking a stroll admiring the architecture. It literally looked like a deer, I could only see its head and neck. It made no sound when I saw it come out. We made eye contact and I was about 15-20 feet away. Only thing was this thing was literally 7 feet tall. In the first 2 seconds I saw it, I was stunned, and cautious. It then suddenly tilted its neck 90 degrees and I ran so fast back to my car that shit freaked me out. But it happened so suddenly I don't talk about it much. It's not a credible story for me. Other than that I had one ghost experience as a child. Shit is ingrained in my memory. I can never rule out the supernatural because of that experience. Guess I've had three poltergeist events too but again I don't find them compelling enough, just, unexplainable. I was with some friends screwing around in the mountains above Spokane during hunting season. We were driving up a dirt road when we saw some lights on the hillside above us 
maybe 300 yards away, over a creek and up a hillside. It was dark enough and we were in a canyon that the sides looked pitch black except for three red lights. I thought it was hunters with headlamps set to red to keep their night vision, but they were acting kinda funny. They seemed to be hopping up and down every so often, even playing leapfrog. They never disappeared behind each other and moved pretty quickly at times. We ended up outside of the truck watching them and trying to see through the binoculars. They went out in the middle of the hill and we watched a minute longer with nothing happening. At that point, my buddy got out his massive spotlight. We lit up the hillside, everything looked normal but where the lights were was a rocky cliff face with sheer drops and overhangs. We decided to head back at that point and started driving back down. Took a wrong turn and ended up on an impassable road, by truck, that led to the top of a ridge line. My friend starts backing out when the entire forest lights up with an intense blue-white light. We all look up out the windows expecting to see a helicopter or something, but none of us can actually pinpoint the source. My buddy stomps on the gas in reverse, we go flying and right when we break out onto the main road, the light shuts off. It was far too bright to be a spotlight, being near a ridgeline I had a decent view and it seemed like a large area of the forest was lit up like a movie set. We booked it down the mountain and it became a running joke that we scared some fae so they decided to scare us lol. I've been back and seen the rock face in the daytime, but for the life of me I cannot find the other road we pulled onto. I remember it looking really defined when we pulled onto it though and not even questioning if it was the right way. I am a female, 22, I am petite, really pale, and always messy hair. I was wearing loosened clothes, all white, maybe you will guess where I am heading to, I was outside smoking, while sitting on a chair in my front yard. I forgot to mention an essential detail, I live in the countryside, my street leads to fields and forests, the night here hits differently, if you know what I mean. The sky offers some great masterpieces freely to our starry eyes. So yes I was just hyper focusing on the sky. I just stood up and decided to take a picture, I wanted to reproduce it through painting. However, I was really disappointed by my lame camera. So I decided to head out inside to grab one of my parents phones since their quality were better. While I was trying to take some pics, I felt a gaze on me, it was my new neighbor. She was staring at me. I was in my front garden, just in front of her house. I was waiting since in my front yard there is an automatic light, it flashes at any movement and lasts for like 20 seconds. Important element. So I was only visible for a few moments. It was pitch dark again. There are no street lights where I live. So I was relieved to feel invisible. As I was finally taking mesmerized pictures. Out of the blue, the flash of the phone I was holding started to light up. The moon was right on the left side of her house, yeah it looked like I was taking photos of her house. I heard her screaming, I put my hand on the flashlight, turned it off. I was petrified. I didn't know which option was the best. A fleeing right away in my house, so reactivated the flash, looking suspicious B confronted her, also talking to her for the first time, and explaining the whole situation because I scared her quite often. I will explain after the other option. C just disappearing in the dark and waiting. Okay so I am a night owl and I love art. It is not unusual to see me outside standing right in front of my house or in the middle of the driveway past midnight, taking pictures, smoking or just contemplating. So I spooked her multiple times, I know because she said that I was the weird neighbor to someone. One day, I was playing in the front yard, playing with my cat with a red light laser, obviously late at night. I accidentally lighted my laser towards one of her windows, so a flashy red light point was visible. I heard her screaming, lighted up the room, I turned it off and I glanced at her. She was looking at me and shut the curtains. Back to the story, I decided to not move and wait. Then I was like, I should still continue taking pics. I heard loud voices, the front door opened, I heard them walking slowly towards their car and whispering. 
What was I supposed to do? I just took a last pick and headed to my house. As the flash went on, I was petting my cat. I heard her saying again this weird chick. As soon as I closed the door, I laughed out loud. Nervous reaction? Surely, I should find a way to talk to her, reassuring her that I am inoffensive or just remaining the weird neighbor. Alright so this takes place a little over a year ago in the north woods of Wisconsin in winter. My parents had been out of town for probably about a week and I was dog sitting, I was in a big old house alone, which I didn't mind too much. I couldn't drive but I'd take long, cold, winter walks through the woods a few miles to get to the grocery store. I say this to point out that I knew the place pretty well and definitely wasn't scared of the area. On one of the last days they'd be gone I heard a strong distinct whistle. It was at the same tempo of the sound a foghorn would make, but very high pitched. It was pretty loud and sounded incredibly close. I looked out the window and saw nothing and no one, I also heard about nothing, no footsteps, birds, deer or anything else. The silence was so eerie that I could feel my heart pounding, I immediately ran to shut and lock all of the doors and windows. I stayed up about half of the night with the most unsettling feeling I just couldn't shake, like when you know that something's watching you. I also want to mention that my closest neighbors were completely out of town and I saw no footsteps the next morning except my own. I grew up in Hillsboro, just down the road, and there was something that haunted me during those years, a tall, featureless figure darker than the darkest night. It appeared in my room on multiple occasions, always in a different position. Sometimes it would be crouched down in the corner, facing the wall, while other times it would lurk inside my closet, staring into its depths. These encounters left me feeling unsettled and frightened. One particular night, shortly before I was about to leave for college, the figure took on a more terrifying form. As I awoke from my sleep, I saw it bent over at a perfect 90 degree angle, its face positioned directly above mine. It started repeating the same phrase, over and over again, in a haunting voice, I am here, I am here. The words echoed through the room, sending shivers down my spine. That night marked the last time I ever saw the figure. As I left for college, I hoped to leave behind the unsettling experiences of my childhood. However, the memory of that encounter remains deeply ingrained in my mind. It's both fascinating and unsettling to hear someone from the same area recounting a similar experience. To this day, I find myself reflecting on those encounters and wondering about the true nature of that mysterious figure. What was it? What did it want? The questions remain unanswered, and the memory of those eerie encounters continues to leave an indelible mark on my consciousness. It's a reminder that there are inexplicable forces in this world that we may never fully understand. I was born and raised and currently live in the very rural north woods of Wisconsin near the UP border of Michigan on land that was originally, and still somewhat sparsely, populated by the Ojibwe people. I had a similar experience this past February, 2023, that I can't shake. I was solo snowshoeing an isolated trail system in the Chekmagon Nicolet National Forest in the Lake Superior Snowbelt, not far from my home. It's a beautifully remote place that I've explored many times alone, often never crossing paths with another person. This time, it was sunny late afternoon. I was again alone on a particularly scenic trail paralleling a small, fast-flowing river, which was open and only iced over on the banks, enjoying the serene scene accompanied by the sweet songs of chickadees and industrious sounds of nuthatches amplified by the cold calm. As I got further on the trail, I noticed it suddenly got very quiet, which wasn't alarming at first as the winter woods can get very silent, especially considering our high snowfall amounts that blanket the land. Then, out of nowhere, I heard a rhythmic, deep, and reedy sound of a low but loud whistle through the brittle woods. I was captivated as I had never heard that sound before. 
It had a powerful pulse to it that I can't really describe. I am an avid birder, admittedly, not an expert, but I was baffled. The noise was somewhat close when I first noticed it, but instead of being curious, I became concerned as I heard the sound getting closer to me. The sound inexplicably filled me with dread. It seemed to be traveling quickly, maybe as fast as a bounding deer, and seemed physically low, the utterance coming from somewhere just above the ground and well below the treetops. While I was out there, I rationalized that the strange vocalization must be from a raven. Ravens are year-round residents up north, so I am very familiar with them. They are highly intelligent birds with complex, individualized calls that include deep sounds like croaks. However, I have never, ever, in my four decades of living up here have ever heard a raven utter a sound like that noise. That day I was deep in the woods and was the first person breaking trail after a big snow, so I couldn't move fast. I decided that my best course of action was to just keep going until I got to a switchback that would shorten my journey. As I paralleled the river from a ridge above dense with new pine growth, I heard the sound from what seemed to be between me and the river, maybe 50 yards maximum. I stopped and listened as it moved on and beyond, still paralleling the river. I couldn't see much ahead of me and I did not hear any footfall of it breaking the snow. Honestly, as irrational as I felt, I was grateful to be hidden. I hauled it to the trailhead and got out of there as fast as I could. As soon as I got home I started researching and seeking out any information on what bird or animal could have created that vocalization. Nothing I found matched that sound. To this day, I just tell myself it must have been a raven, but I know in my own small understanding of the world that it was something else. When I was 13, 14, me and my friends would sneak out and go hang out with our boyfriends out in the middle of nowhere. We lived basically in the middle of nowhere, so going to random back roads was pretty much our only option for having fun. We would go to this place called the locals called the tunnel. It was just a dirt road with tall trees and overgrown willows on both sides. It was very secluded, so we would go there to drink beer, smoke weed, and make out with our boyfriends. They would always tell us spooky stories of a large black dog that would chase their car every time they went down there at night. They said one time they went there during the day and the saw the dog dead and mangled on the side of the road. The next time they went back at night, the black dog was alive and well, and chasing after their car again. I knew they were just telling us these stories to scare us, and I wasn't sure if I really believed them, since I had came down to this place with them a few times and I had never seen the black dog. One night around 1 or 2 in the morning, we were sitting in our friend's car in the tunnel. We had all been drinking and smoking weed. We were all joking and laughing when suddenly the driver whispers what is that up there? I looked and didn't see anything so I replied there's nothing up there, your eyes are playing tricks on you. No, seriously, there's something in the road up there he replies. The guy sitting in the passenger seat agrees and says he sees something too. The driver puts the car in drive and starts slowly rolling forward and a figure emerges from the dark. A man in shorts is standing in the middle of the road watching us drive towards him. This is a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, at 2 in the morning on a very cold fall night, and this man is standing in the road wearing nothing but shorts. Not even shoes on. Just shorts. What the F is he doing? The driver says as he pushes on the brakes and stops the car. We all stare for a moment at this man just staring at us. His eyes were glowing, like a deer's eyes do in headlights. I've never seen a person's eyes glow like that before. We all start freaking out and then the driver says F this. And starts driving forward. Fast. The man just keeps staring at us until we get about 10 feet away and then he just calmly walks to the side of the road and vanishes. There was nowhere for him to go. There were 6 feet tall fences with willows overgrown over the fence, making the barrier at least 10 feet tall. No human man could have cleared all of that. I still can't explain it to this day.
I lived in an apartment in Durham that was badly haunted. For almost six months I was visited by a demonic entity at night that came from the woods out back. It's a whole story but the boyfriend independently confirmed what I was seeing without me mentioning a thing and that told me I wasn't going crazy. It made me so sick I almost died, three years later and I'm slowly recovering. We had to have the house blessed, which I've never done before but it was a last ditch effort. Moved to a new location and both the boyfriend and I have seen spirits walking around the home, luckily nothing demonic. I would normally think I'm crazy but when you have someone else independently verify things you begin to trust it's actually happening. One night we both saw his father come down the stairs and walked into the kitchen. His father has Parkinson's and the entity was so vivid we thought he passed upstairs in his room. After SH-ting ourselves, we both go running to check on him and he was fine in the shower. So many experiences and even the ones I'm talking about have much more to the story. I've experienced stuff like this my whole life, but the area here is very active. I did learn that a huge war was fought in Durham, so perhaps that's the reason. I'll probably never know. My mom called me late at night last year freaking out. She was home by herself and completely terrified. As she made her way down the hall to her bedroom, she was suddenly met W a loud weird high pitched whistling coming from her open bedroom window. She was frozen with fear. When I tried to reason with her that it could have been an owl or something of that nature, she stayed adamant that it couldn't be. Because whatever it was, she could tell it was pushed up against her window screen. And since her windows were a good 7 feet off the ground with no ledge whatsoever it just didn't make any sense. She could tell it wasn't human. Whatever it was. I have no problem believing it could have been something unexplained, since I honestly could write a chapter book of the extremely odd supernatural things I've experienced in my life. When I was around 15 me and my friends were driving around going to all the haunted places around the basin. It was getting close to Halloween, so as is tradition we were all trying to scare each other. First we went to a place called the Haunted Woods. This is an actual business, not a place in the woods. Then we went to an abandoned hotel near the Ute Reservation. Nothing of significance happened there, we didn't see or hear anything and we were just goofing around and having fun. Then the driver says we were going to Skinwalker Ranch. I had never heard of Skinwalker Ranch, but I had heard plenty of stories of Skinwalkers. I was intrigued at first, but as we dropped down the hill back behind the property a feeling a total dread settled on me like a heavy blanket. Everyone in the car got more and more quiet, like they were feeling the heaviness too. I don't think we should go here. I spoke softly. Oh, we're going. The driver announced there's no moon tonight and no flashlights allowed, he continued. I will just stay in the truck then, I have a really bad feeling, and I don't want to go. I spoke again. You aren't staying in my truck alone, now get out, he said rudely. I got out of the truck and looked over at my best friend. Her face was white and her eyes were wide and round and I knew she felt the same way that I did. We shouldn't be here. The driver of the truck said that this was the back end of the huge ranch. I wouldn't have believed him that this was really Skinwalker Ranch if I didn't feel that it was in every nerve ending of my body. He walked over to an ancient post and pole fence, undid the loop of wire holding up a small gate, and laid it on the ground. There was an overgrown two-track road leading up into the darkness and we followed as he led us up it. The horrible feeling of dread was almost overwhelming and I felt like I was going to be sick. I wanted to go running back to the truck, but had a deep fear that something would pounce the moment I left the safety of the group. We weren't laughing and joking here. That heaviness was weighing on all of us and we walked silently through the dark. As we walked I tried to keep my eyes on my feet, but I would occasionally glance to either side of the two-track road. Each time I did I would see a huge black mass out in the tall grass. I told myself it was just a cow, but each time I looked it was in the same spot off to the left, following our journey to the old homestead. Finally, 
The driver and leader of our foolish expedition stopped and said that we were almost to the old homestead. That we needed to stay quiet in case the owners were around. As he turned to start walking again a growl leapt from the darkness and he stopped and took a step back. He wasn't our fearless leader anymore. His voice shook as he told us it was time to head back to the truck. We walked a little ways back and then one of our group said they needed to use the bathroom. We stopped by a small stream running along the south end of the property. I was smoking and talking to one of my friends about how relieved I was that we were leaving. I glanced down at the stream at the same time my friend did. Just in time to see a black figure emerging from the water. It was not a cow. It was not a coyote. It looked like a too skinny and too tall man. We both screamed and ran back to the road. That was the last straw for everyone and we all ran the entire way back to the truck. Now I know that is eerie, but kind of uneventful. Have no fear. My story isn't over yet. A few months later this adventure had slowly left my mind. I had started to convince myself that the figures in the darkness were just cows and that it probably was just the dark running water playing tricks on my eyes making me see things emerging from the water that weren't really there. My best friend had come over to my house to sit outside, bullshit, and smoke cigarettes. We did this pretty frequently. Like I said in my last story, we lived in the middle of nowhere, so dumb things like this were about as much fun as we could have. So, we are sitting in her car just across the road from my house. Her car is pointed towards the town park, which was just about a block away from my house. There are no other houses on the way to the park, so with the street lamps on at the park, you can basically see everything up there. Oh, look a deer. My friend says suddenly. I could see a set of glowing eyes on the very far end of the park. Oh, yep, there it is. I reply. We watch it as it slowly walks towards the center of the park. In this spot is a huge metal slide slash jungle gym thing, that is probably 10-12 feet tall. As the deer is walking I notice that for some reason I can't make out any features of the deer. It seems to always be just out of reach of the street lamps that are dotted throughout the park. The deer is right next to the slide when suddenly it stands up. The eyes that we were watching are suddenly even with the platform of the slide. Which would make this deer 10-12 feet tall. Then it starts to walk standing on its hind legs. Me and friend both started panicking. What the F is it? That's not a deer. We keep watching this extremely tall creature cross the park when my friend decided we're driving up there. She locks the doors and we head towards the park. When we were almost there the eyes had crossed the street and went into the neighborhood across from the park. By the time we got there, whatever it was had vanished. Another few months go by, the event had definitely rattled us and there was no convincing ourselves that it was a deer. Deer do not walk on their hind legs and they are not 10 feet tall. One night, I am at the same friend's house. This friend lived smack dab in the middle of huge farmland. All around her were pastures. It was very peaceful most of the time. We had spent the night watching movies and hanging out. I went and started my car and we were smoking together on her porch before I left. We were just chatting when suddenly her eyes leave my face and look behind me and her eyes grow wide. I turn to look and see two glowing red eyes just past the fence into her neighbor's pasture. What the F is that? I managed to squeak out. I don't know. She whispers back. The eyes remained fixed on us for about 30 seconds then turned to the left, blinked, and vanished. We both ran back in the house. I didn't dare go home for another 45 minutes. If my car hadn't been already started, I probably wouldn't have left at all. A couple of years after these events, I was speaking with a Ute tribal member that I worked with and she said something that gives me goosebumps to this day. She told me it isn't what's on the ranch that you should be afraid of, it's what follows you when you leave. I am convinced that something followed us from Skinwalker Ranch and those terrifying events was something warning us to never go back. I never did and I never will. I used to work on the North Slope of Alaska in the oil industry. 
The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet. And when I say the sun hadn't come up I mean in almost a month and a half, polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska. Deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety, no cell reception and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out in a set time they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about 4 in the morning, not that it mattered in the land of endless night, and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. When something appeared on the road in our headlights. It was a man. In jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket. Walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 am and it was minus 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack? Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold, his clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off him. He smelled. Acidic? If that makes sense? There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him though this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me with this look of pure rage not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popsicle. At that moment this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held onto my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, if could only have been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another 30 miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore and when he pulled back his sleeve there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard and were told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. The next time we saw the guard at this shack we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popsicle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12 hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude if he even was a dude.
The Alaskan tundra is a weird place and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.